School Committee to order. This meeting is being conducted remotely via Zoom webinar per our remote participation policy, BEDJA. The following 10 members, I think, although I didn't count, are in attendance via Zoom. Diane Baum, Kira Cook, Adam Klein, Jenny Kremer, Amy Krishnamurthy, John Peterson, Nora Schein, Angie So, Yebin Wang, and myself. Evelyn Abaya Issa will be absent tonight. Due to the two recent Zoom bombing incidents at our meetings, public participation has been changed for this meeting as noted on the agenda. And we'll get to the specifics of that in a moment. Um, our school committee meetings are live streamed on Acton TV's YouTube channel. The links and phone number are found on the posted agenda on the abschools.org calendar. This meeting is also being recorded and will be posted on Acton TV's website at actontv.org. Per our rule policy, all votes will be done by roll call. I will call each member's name and they will state how they vote. Thank you for joining us. Um, as part of tonight's meeting, um, Peter and, and I decided to suspend the, the traditional um, public participation policies that we have in place. And so you know, you'll know, you know in your um, own agenda that we have a recommendation to ter temporarily suspend public participation policy. But what I want people to understand is why. So it may seem easy to run these meetings. Um, it's certainly easier to do it in person than it is to do via Zoom. But I'm human. And I have to tell you that the last two meetings where we have had these kinds of interruptions are extremely jarring. And although I was not the... Um, target of, of any of the things that happened, it didn't make it any easier. And I have to tell you that I've had a constant pit in my stomach before school committee meetings to know that anything could be, could happen, could interrupt us, because the very first thing they teach you in school committee school is <laughs> that school committee meetings are business meetings that are held in public. They are not public meetings. And although we certainly appreciate and enjoy having the public participate in these meetings. This is not any way, this is not being done so that we are punishing all of the public. There are many school committees that accept only public participation through written comment submitted before the meeting, um, especially in the era of Zoom. So I just want to make clear that this is not a punishment. It is a break. It is a break for me. It is a break for members who are targeted, and it is not permanent. But I couldn't run this meeting tonight knowing that it could be interrupted again. And while we get our policies in place and we make sure that things are going to work, obviously nothing is 100%, but I needed time to recover. So I just wanted under everyone in the public to understand that. There was a lot of thought that went into how we were going to handle public participation tonight. And there's a lot of things on our agenda a lot of things we need to vote on and a lot of things that we really need to pay attention to. And so to accomplish all of those things, it was my decision, since apparently it's at the discretion of the chair as to how to handle public participation. So I wanted you to know why I was doing it. So, Jessica, can I just add one thing? Sure. Because I know we have the recommendation before the committee, but I just wanted to give you an update. You know, I've been doing some work uh, behind the scenes to investigate ways that we can have public participation safely. I've had an opportunity to, to communicate with several members in our community who are information technology and information security specialists um, who have given us a few recommendations. Our tech staff has also been researching recommendations. Uh, we considered reaching out to some additional firms um, to consult with as well and to see how our practices were currently working. But um, as we learned more from some of our community members who were information security specialists, um, there is no foolproof way to present some, prevent someone from behaving badly during public speak um, or public participation. Um, the same holds true when people come in person. Um, someone could come up to a microphone in person and you know not behave well. Um, we can't prevent that. However, the level of deterrent when someone has to do that in person is significantly higher than online. And we've learned that certainly firsthand. Um, similarly, because we couldn't, 100% guarantee that we are looking at ways that we can significantly deter that and we're continuing to investigate some of those. I did speak with the Attorney General's office this week um, to see if they have any technical assistance they can provide. They do not do that um, and they don't provide that service. However, they did refer me to a couple of other sources that I want to investigate a little bit. Um, ultimately, 
Um, I do think that some of the recommendations that have come forward from some of the information security specialists in the community um, with a couple of modifications, because we actually think that we could um, apply a couple of other things to make it even more secure, uh, could very well be doable. Uh, we just need enough time to investigate that, test it, and make sure that um, the way we intend it to work actually can work when we go live into a public meeting. So, um, you know, I would just say to our community, you know, we do not want to curtail public speak. That is not our intent of doing this, uh, but we want to make sure that any solutions we put in place have been tested and, you know, can work to the greatest extent possible. Thanks, Peter. So because the public has been asked to email any comments by two o'clock prior to this meeting tonight, we'll not be taking any additional comments or questions at this meeting. We'll need to temporarily suspend our current public participation policy, BEDH. This is per our suspension of policies policy, BGF, and requires a two thirds vote from the committee. It will also be reviewed at our next meeting. As I said before, this is not a permanent solution. It was a break. And so, um, you know, Peter did his did his research, and I also spoke to our MASE, Mass Association of School Committees field director, and this was a, a recommended route um, while we are figuring out the, the rest of everything else. So anyway, um, there's a motion in, in uh, sample motion on page four of the packet if anyone wants to make that. Adam? I move to temporarily suspend public participation at school committee meetings, policy BEDH. Second. Okay, we'll do a roll call vote. Adam? Yes. Angie? Yes. John? Yes. Nora? Yes. Kira? Yes. Amy? Yes. Yevin? Yes. Diane? Yes. And Jenny? Yes. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, so the way it's going to work is that um, Adam has copies of all of the comments that came in prior today to to two o'clock today, and just as we would do in a regular meeting, uh, each of those comments will be allotted three minutes. So um, this time I get to time <laughs> Adam as the public participant, and he will read the. Um, the comments from the community. Okay. First comment is from Elliot Donald. Ladies and gentlemen, last week I watched the Acton Boxborough Regional School District School Committee's chair read a statement about the issue of the colonial. Near its end, she concluded an email that I had submitted immediately following the 15 October meeting, communicating a change in my position on the colonial from favoring retention to, quote, convinced that its retirement was the right thing for the school, close quote. The chair closed her statement with an assertion that the committee would not be reconsidering its vote and added a postscript that she hoped that this is the last we have to say about the colonial. In late September, I learned that ABSEJ had petitioned the school committee to retire the colonial as the mascot because of the racism the group felt it symbolized and of the school committee's solicitation for community comment of the 25th of September. Stunned by an effort to connect the colonial that I had always felt to be a fine representative of the town while no longer a member of, quote, the community, I set to work on a letter to refute the idea that the colonial was a symbol of racism and or of colonialism. I contended rather that the colonial hearkened specifically to 37 residents of Acton who on April 19th, 1775, left behind the safety of their homes to join a fight against the best trained army of the day and take the quote action that took what the action they took was the best way they knew how to improve their own condition and make a better life for themselves, their families and their community. I submitted that letter on five October. Given rumors that the committee had already made up its mind on the issue, I remember thinking that among the most difficult things to do in the world is to admit that one's initial position is wrong. I awaited the Zoom meeting of 15 October, hopeful that many letters of a tone similar to mine would be persuasive in favor of the colonial. As I watched the meeting, I saw a civil exchange of ideas, but it became apparent that the community's input had not been favorably per persuasive. Though my sense of what the colonial stands for had not and has not changed, the letters that had been submitted as represented by the school committee, committee seemed to reflect a hateful tone surrounding the colonial and impressed upon me impressed upon me a sense that colonial, 
at the Colonial that I knew did not represent the town and thus should be retired. That evening, I emailed the committee reflecting this statement. In the weeks that followed, I looked for confirmation that my revised position was correct. I listened for the hateful tone I understood that the community's written comment had carried at subsequent school committee meetings. While I heard one commentator's remarks indicating that a deliberate months-long process had been employed to change the RJ Gray mascot in the 90s, I heard much of the town's history that echoed my 5 October letters sentiment. I did not hear the tone that had inspired my 15 October email. When the letters that had been submitted attended the school committee's 25th September solicitation were released, I joined a group of school district citizens who divided them up to look for indicators that reflected the racism of the town. I read over 100 of them. To confirm the committee's 7 January statement, there were a good number of retain emails that were of the nature of a subject line that read, Mine is off. <clears throat> Question. Next, uh, next uh, email. Yeah, Amy, that's your question. Um, considering that the individual can't read the letter themselves, that someone else is reading it for them, can we extend the time a bit? There's quite a few letters, and honestly, I, I would, you know, we would have cut them off at at three minutes if they were speaking to us. So okay, what? A, okay, thank you. Yep. All right. Go ahead, Adam. The next email is from Leo Falkman, Wright Terrace, West Acton. I've re-listened to all school committee meetings about the retirement of the colonial name. What I heard from the chairperson was that email notifications were sent to stakeholders, the community, junior high, and high school student. According to the finance committee charts shown during the meeting of 11-24-2020, which can be viewed on YouTube, approximately 65% of Acton's town budget goes to the schools. Also displayed at the meeting was the fact that only 21.5% of households in Acton have children under 17. Therefore, a large majority of households do not have children in the school system. Since retiring of the colonial name is an expensive project, were all taxpayers notified about the impact the decision will have, a potential increase or reallocation of the school budget? I'm only one taxpayer, but I searched my email archive and cannot find an email notification about the issue of the colonial name being retired before the vote. Some might say that enough people were notified that, I sh that it should have been communicated by word of mouth, but we are not in ordinary times. Because of the pandemic, we are not socializing like we had in the past. There has been less of an opportunity to, to discuss town issues. If this issue is not communicated to all taxpayers, then I believe this is a form of taxation without representation. The superintendent of schools has said that because of the high cost of retiring the colonial name, it will take time to make the change. Also, I have not seen any information about what the colonial name will be replaced with. Should guidelines be put in place? Should this issue occur again in the future? If most students are really behind this, why didn't they hold fundraisers to pay for the change? I believe more discussion is warranted. I brought up a few questions and understand that you do not want to respond to all questions, but could someone out on the school committee please answer the simple question, what percent of taxpayers in Acton and Boxborough were not notified directly about the retirement of the colonial name and the potential financial burden that the Act in Boxborough taxpayer will bear. That's the end of the message. Included though were some charts uh, from the finance committee presentation. Great, thank you. Okay, the next email is from Corinne Hogseth, 61 Seminole Road in Acton. My statement is in response to the chair's January 7th comments regarding public participation over the last few months. That statement, riddled with obvious omissions, wraps up with this gem, quote, the decision has been made by unanimous consent, as if it makes it more right. What it actually demonstrates, once again, is the committee's inability and unwillingness to properly resent all view, represent all views in Acton and Boxborough. This is not about agreeing to disagree. This is about a, about a the incredibly poor timing of raising a topic that was bound to be divisive throughout all levels of our community. This concern was raised in many of the emails sent to the school committee just prior to the October 15 meeting, even from people who supported ABSEJ petition. This is also largely about process, and your process was a joke. It went for months over the summer when only those who were agitating to kill the colonial and their supporters on the school committee. 
the, uh, and their supporters on the school committee, the administration and eCares knew about it. The key petition, whose authors were too fearful to go public with their identities, wasn't even started until after the September 25th email to the community, when the ABSEDGE petition, with the obvious support of the school committee, was sprung on the AB community. Even though they had only a few weeks to respond, that KEEP petition wound up with significantly more support than the KILL petition, the only one you considered official. Your process also violated every aspect of your own naming policy, which states, the Acton Boxborough Regional School Committee believes naming or renaming a school building, structure, space, property program, or other district asset is a matter of significant importance, one that des deserves the most thoughtful attention of the school committee and the administration, and one that is an unusual occurrence or event. Further, the committee believes it should not be influenced in its decision by personal prejudice, favoritism, political pressure, or temporary popularity. There was a right way and a wrong way to go about coming to this decision. You chose the wrong way. You folks can keep telling yourselves that the decision to kill the colonial was fair, open, and thoughtful, but we all know it was only as open as the chair and her progressive allies on the committee wished it to be. The chair, in the fashion typical of the AB school committee and some members of the staff and faculty, bullied colleagues into a vote without allowing due process. You choose to dismiss at least half the community. The right way would be to consider this vote, have a cooling off period of six to 12 months, after which a committee made up of stakeholders from throughout the community would define a thoughtful process, allowing and encouraging all to weigh in, discuss, debate, and come to a consensus. Even those who would disagree with the outcome would have to agree that the process was fair and open. <clears throat> the original intent of public schools was to teach civics, to ensure that America would have an educated citizenry without... Hi. Okay, the next one is from Laura Plaskoon. Dear Superintendent Light and School Committee members, I am appreciative of the efforts of the administration and educators to respond to and implement structured learning time changes per DESE guidance over the past 30 days. I'm hopeful that the additional learning time will be beneficial in providing incremental, much needed connections for all students. While I'm thankful for the teacher, to the teachers and administration for efficiently planning and communicating these changes. It is concerning that the administrators, administration and educators have never, to my knowledge, shared why DESE changed their regulations. In an amendment issued on December 18th, DESE outlined their reasons. They note that over the fall, there has been a distressing amount of, a distressing increase in the mental health challenges our students are facing. The CDC has noticed an increase in the proportion of child emergency department visits for mental health related reasons. Such visits have increased 24% for children's age 5 to 11, 31% for children's aged 12 to 17 over the prior year. They cite a literature review in the Journal of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry on the impact of loneliness and isolation on mental health found that, quote, social isolation and loneliness increased the risk of depression and possibly anxiety at a time which loneliness was measured. DESE's recommendations are based on the belief that one way to prevent the isolation and disconnection that many students are feeling is frequent connections and interactions with teachers and peers. This is a well-intentioned rationale that supports the district's priorities of safety and health, supporting social emotional well-being, and prioritizing connections. I feel DESE's rationale should be acknowledged by the administration and the school committee. By not sharing or acknowledging, it permits a belief that DESE is merely enacting unjustified bureaucracy that is clearly not the entire story. Personally, my kids are experiencing an increase in anxiety as well as more frequent periods of anger and sadness. The brief okay. survey that was distributed about the learning changes during the holidays not only did not provide context, it did not ask enough questions to really understand how families are doing. We encourage the school committee to do a more detailed survey of parents and families to gather information on how families are managing during this challenging year, what concerns they have about how this year is affecting their children, and what they think would make the situation better. Sincerely, Laura Plaskoon, mom to a seventh, second and fifth grader at Miriam and a seventh grader at RJ Gray. Next email is from <coughs> Mike Onigman. <coughs> The importance of in-person learning is well documented. 
In a hybrid learning option, in all honesty, no one really wins. The quality of, the, of education is degraded with less live learning time. Lack of connection leads to feelings of isolation, depression, and anxiety in students. Educators are stretched and staffing is nearly impossible. Parents are being asked to take on added responsibilities. The solution is a safe return to full in-person learning. A safe return to full in-person learning must inherently include risk mitigation measures such as masking, hygiene, and ventilation. The safe return must also consider the perception of safety felt by students, families, and educators. A July 2020 survey of Acton Boxborough Education Association members found that 50% did not want to return to school buildings in the planned hybrid model. The ABA initially voted to endorse a remote-only learning plan. The power and influence of the ABA, ABEA on any change to learning model, modes is apparent. So how do we convince our educators, students, and families that in-person schooling is safe? We need to look at, the, at steps being taken by many of our peer school districts to implement large-scale COVID testing of their staff and student populations. Many districts are pursuing either their own testing programs or taking part in the free six-week pool testing program announced by DESE on January 8th. Districts such as Littleton, Concord Carlisle, Lincoln Sudbury, Wellesley, Wayland, Weston, Harvard, and Lexington have either implemented or are exploring testing programs. Wellesley has been testing since October. They have tested over 18,000 samples with a 0.1% positive test rate. A goal of their program was to reduce the level of fear and anxiety among staff and parents. Surveys show that it is working. Only 12% of the staff surveyed stated they were comfortable being in person without a testing program. After seeing the result of the testing program, 82% stated they were reassured in the safety of returning to school. Acton Boxborough is consistently cited as one of the top school districts in Massachusetts. We are leaders. I'm not aware of any discussion of a testing program to date and do not see the topic on tonight's agenda. We are not currently leaders in this effort. I'm asking the school committee and district leadership to build a plan to return to in-person schooling, work with the ABEA to survey their membership, and take steps to build confidence in the safety of in-person schooling by pursuing a robust testing program. Thank you, Mike Onigman. <clears throat> the next email is from Scott Smyers. Dear esteemed committee members, one, I understand online virtual meetings are not ideal and subject to distractions and problems with unwelcomed interruptions. However, I suggest you require participants to pre-register for the meeting, then you can allow the public to speak during the meeting. Restricting public participation to written comments is not true public participation and will lead to more problems and distrust. Two, town committees and boards should have a uniform, agreed upon standard response plan to unwelcome intrusions where someone interrupts a public meeting with inappropriate statements or questions. This is not just happening in Acton. It's happening all over the state and country. There are effective ways to deal with it. Any such comments should be immediately ignored and marginalized, not highlighted and brought to the forefront. However, such infractions should be investigated and if warranted, pursued legally. This would allow us to participate and proceed with important town business without marginalizing public input. Three, in the SC's decision on the Colonial, you did not consider three important residents of Acton who all served as soldiers against the British during the Revolutionary War and chose Acton as their home. John Oliver, William Cutting, and Caesar Thompson, all non-white non men who fought for our freedom and served honorably and received pensions. If you had simply reviewed the local historical society's recent blogs or asked about this topic, you would have found this wonderful information readily available. Posted July 2020. HTTPS, www.actonhistoricalsociety.org slash blog slash Acton's early black residents. Why not revisit this topic and add to the story of Acton, Acton's colonials rather than abandoning the name altogether? We now know that veterans from the Revolutionary War included people of color that chose to live in Acton. Ad, Acton didn't choose them. Why? There was a reason why they settled in Acton and had families here, some for generations. Do you think Oliver, Thompson, and Cutting were not proud of their service to the, their country and what they had overcome rebelling against the British? Thompson was a slave before the war and was freed after his service. The more we can learn about these men and their families, the better we can understand and be inspired by their stories. I expect these men of the past would agree with me in comparing the meaning of the team name colonial to colonialism is like saying the word menu is sexist because it 
and should be changed to women you. Both words share some of the same letters, but have very different meanings. All right, 30 Thank you for your consideration, and I encourage you to reconsider the colonial name and approach the review process at a slower place, pace with an inclusive public committee. Scott Smyers, Central Street. That is the last of the public comments. Peter, I imagine you're watching the attendee list there. Um, I have not been. Oh, well, there was something of note that now has either been renamed or deleted. That's fine. Um, all right. So your update is next. So, you know, first, thank you. Um, you know, before I get into a little bit of the business update, I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, some of what we just heard and, you know, other things going on in our community um, around these discussions. <clears throat> so last week at, you know, one of our public meetings of the Active Leadership Group, the chair of the select board called on me during the public comment period to issue clarification with the community about racist attacks in the school committee and to make this right with the community. In addition, the chair also stated that I must rectify the rush to judgment and the impact it's had on those members of the community, falsely linked to the Zoom bombing at the start of our, and to start our community on a path of healing. The committee and I have also received several emails demanding an apology for comments made or perceived that racism exists in Acton and Boxborough. I've been thinking quite about this over the last week and wanna offer a few thoughts. Because in the absence of what some in our community will hope for in the form of an apology, I believe an explanation is deserved, so our community understands why I'm so committed to this work. To be clear, neither I nor my leadership indicated that we believed any individual in our community was responsible for the attacks. We did express disappointment that some in the community took the opportunity to criticize the targets of the attack for their reactions. My mind has continued to come back to the same series of questions over the last few weeks. Why aren't we hearing calls from the black and brown members of our community to retract statements, clarify details, and rectify the rush to judgment? Similarly, when we have had anti-Semitic incidents in our district, why have we not heard the members of our Jewish community come forward with statements such as, this is not us, and anti-Semitism doesn't exist in our schools and community? Who owns the decision to determine if something is biased, racist, or hateful, or to make declarations that racism doesn't exist in our community and dismiss those who say it does. What does it mean if only the white voices hold this view? As we start our community on a path to healing, whose healing are we speaking of? As a community, we're struggling to understand and hear each other on these important issues, and we're confusing important concepts such as hate, racism, and bias. They are close relatives, but they are not the same. I know we are proud of our history, through comments shared in the retirement of the mascot, we heard that Acton was home to one, if not now several, of the first free black men to fight in the Revolutionary War. This is something to be proud of, but why did it take nearly 250 years for a black person to be elected to a position within our government? More importantly, why would asking this question um, or a question like this so offend some and yet affirm the views of others? We all have different backgrounds and experiences that color the lenses with which we see the world. If we cannot recognize our own lenses and its limitations, we will likely miss the opportunity to learn about how our neighbors and friends experiences may differ from our own. The incidents at our school committee meetings have been isolated in that they came from far away, but we have heard time and time again that bias and racism can and do exist everywhere, even here. As individuals, we did not create racism or the first racist ideas in our nation's history. These existed in our country from its founding. That someone is the target of racism should offend us, but we should not be offended by the person who shares that experience. And we don't need to recoil at the notion that racism and bias exist in our schools and communities. What we own is our response to racism and the opportunity to become more inclusive schools and communities. Let's not misplace our time and energy trying to prove we are not racist when we can instead focus on making our schools and communities better for those who are impacted by racism and other forms of bias. For the first several hundred years of our existence, our communities were predominantly white and centered in the European experience. So our traditions and cultural norms naturally centered around these experiences. 
but we've changed rapidly. Our income in kindergarten class is now a majority non-white. As a school system, we need to rethink our existing norms and traditions and ensure that moving forward, they reflect the community who we are, as in the past, we needed to reflect the community we were. What would it mean if the traditions and norms that are embraced and centered around the experiences of the members of our very diverse community? This doesn't mean that we need to abandon everything and start over, but it means that we need to listen to some new voices, in particular, those voices that haven't been heard before, and make sure that our schools reflect them all. I understand that for some of us, this means we will feel some loss that our community reflects us to a slightly lesser degree, especially when we lose the symbols that we hold so dear. But we also need to remember the voices of those people who have not been able to feel an equal part of our community or who have not had an opportunity to have their symbols represented in our culture. Superintendents and school leaders are taught to be keenly aware of the dangers around us. This is often referred to as, quote, political awareness. In fact, the title of one of the most well-read and talked about books in leadership programs by authors Heifetz and, Lin Heifetz and Linsky speaks right to this bluntly. It's called Leadership on the Line, Staying Alive Through the Dangers of Leading. I'll come back to that in a moment. To speak to the masculine, I recognize the decision has disappointed some and angered others. I understand and recognize that some felt the process was not open or one they felt a part of. While I may disagree, I'm not here to argue this point with you, but this decision has now been made. Since the decision was made, our staff have spent hundreds of hours this year responding to records requests, open meeting law complaints, and ongoing calls for a return of the mascot and a new start to these discussions. Today, we received another records request that will likely take our staff dozens of additional hours of time to compile. We cannot continue to prioritize this distraction over our need to focus on other important issues like our students, their educational needs, and our planning for them to return to our schools and classrooms. We understand our legal requirements to respond to the requests, but out of respect for everyone's time and energy, and regardless of continued pressure for a different outcome, we consider, and I consider, this issue resolved, and I am not engaging in a further dialogue about this. We will begin moving forward to work with the high school to outline a process for determining a new mascot. The process will be led by the high school and its students. The process will be inclusive of all members of our community and in an appropriate way that it will be determined by our students. This includes those members of the community who believe we should not have retired the mascot to begin with. I understand some may still be angry enough about the choice to retire the mascot that you do not want to be engaged, but please know the offer will be extended. I feel badly that there are members of our community who have been off put and offended by statements we've released and in some of the work in which we are engaged now, but I cannot offer an apology. After much soul searching over this year, and at times a degree of self-doubt, I've become comfortable with the idea that I wasn't hired to, quote, stay alive, as I spoke about before, through the dangers that may come my way. I was hired to do the right thing. Right now, at this time in this community, for our students and their families, the right thing is to continue to listen to them value and honor their experiences and make sure that we continue to work toward more inclusive schools. And if that means as a white person, I need to learn to share some, some more of the discomfort that other individuals are our community of color and from different backgrounds have long felt, that's okay. And it's also okay for all of us. I am pleased to announce that we have been in discussions with Visions Inc, an organization, a long history of helping organizations, schools and communities successfully navigate work around diversity, equity, and inclusion. The town managers have been working with Dr. Don Bentley and I in partnership to plan an initial meeting of town leaders with this organization with the goal of quickly expanding the work to have a deep community-wide impact. I am also in discussions to have Vision Inc. work directly with our schools and district to help focus and expand our leadership and implementation of initiatives that can make our schools more equitable and inclusive. I invite all of our community members to come along on this journey toward more just, equitable, and inclusive communities, regardless of each of our own starting places. I was interviewed by Channel 7 News about a week or two ago as they considered airing a piece about the recent incidents here. A question they asked put me by surprise. Is this community broken? After a pause, my answer was something to the effect of, 
No, but we would all do well to better listen to each other, particularly the voices of those who have not historically been heard. But I left the interview feeling like my answer was incomplete and lacking. Yesterday, though, I heard my thoughts completed, albeit much more eloquently, in a line from youth poet laureate Amanda Gorman's inaugural poem. And she said, we have weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. We, our schools, and our community are not broken, but simply unfinished. Thank you. Tessa, you're muted. Yeah, I see. <laughs> no one got me the mug yet, right? Like, <laughs> um, yeah. So Ginny was clapping for you. If we could all applaud, we would. Um, were there other parts of your update update to be included in that? And now, as I said, let's get on to some other business. All right. Thank so you. I do have a few other updates for you, um, and I'll, I'll keep these concise. So leadership search updates. Um, as you're aware, we have three important leadership searches underway, high school principal, director of special education, and principal for the McCarthy Town Elementary School. We enlisted Nesbeck to help with recruiting applicants for both the high school principal and director of special education searches. The high school principal search team has been meeting for several weeks now. The team underwent anti-bias training to better inform the interview process. We've been very, very pleased with the candidate pool for this position, and we have multiple experienced high school principals who have applied. The interview team has been conducting interviews with applicants over the last two weeks, and we anticipate several finalists will be selected for the next round of interviews. Once finalists are selected, we will conduct yet another round of interviews where groups of stakeholders will have the opportunity to meet candidates, and provide me input into the final decision about the next principal of our high school. Our special education director search committee is also underway. Members have gone or are undergoing the same anti-bias training as did the high school search team. Applications for this position close next week and the team will then begin reviewing applicants at that time. We will continue to update our community on the status of the search over the next several weeks. And then also we've officially posted the position for principal at McCarthy Town Elementary School and have begun accepting applicants. Uh, the interview team has been formed and it will begin meeting in the next two weeks. The team will also undergo the same anti-bias screening as the other teams uh, prior to conducting their interviews. So more to come in that important search as well. I also just want to highlight for you um, that, and this will also go out to our, our families and community tomorrow, but we have um, some anonymous donations that came to us that you're going to be approving uh, later in the meeting, um, which have gone into a fund that we established, I'm going to say about a year and a half or two ago, for students who are either homeless or food insecure. Um, and that we've been really, really pleased to be able to start that fund. Um, we will gladly accept any other donations from community members who would like to give to that fund, and they can contact Dave Bertolino um, to be able to donate. So I just wanted to get that out and make sure our community was aware that we have that fund. Um, that is for things that schools cannot traditionally cover that fall outside the curriculum. So at times we're providing coaches, things like that. Um, and then my last announcement um, is just to you know remind people that Tessa and I are resuming our superintendent and chair uh, community coffees. Uh, those will um, be up and running beginning again in February. So um, please stay tuned and we will be sending out more information with Zoom links um, and an opportunity for people to submit questions ahead of time. So thank you very much, and I will turn this back over to Tessa. Thank you. Peter, did anyone have any questions? I forgot. Oh, Dave, you're not muted. Dave, mute you yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, did anyone have any questions for Peter about any of his updates? No? Okay, I don't see any hands. All right, so next um, on our agenda is... Can you raise your hand? Sorry, I raised the hand after you looked down. I'm sorry. That's why you got to put the little hand sticker up, Amy. It's much I easier know. to see. Go I know. Ahead. I didn't find it fast enough. I was, you know, I was writing everything down. Um, I just wanted to say um, thank you. Thank you for everything you had to say um, from beginning to end. I um, feel incredibly proud that um, there were quite a few of us who sat on the hiring committee um, and just feel incredibly proud to have you uh, standing at the helm. You have um, met our expectations, at, at least 
you know, quite a few of us. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. So next on the agenda, we have Sinika Savukowski. I don't know if I pronounced it right. Sinika um, Savukowski. Thank you. <laughs> um, to speak to us um, about some changes to the World Language Program. I'm just looking for her in the attendee list. Here we go. And I'm going to promote Seneca. Here she is. Okay, welcome, Seneca. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so you can go through the presentation. Okay. Welcome, Seneca. And hopefully that's working. Perfect. And you can just say next, Seneca. Okay, great. So thank you for uh, having me this evening. My name is Seneca Sabukowski. Um, I'm the World Language Department leader at the high school, and I look forward to sharing a change that the World Languages Department is very excited about for the upcoming uh, school year. Um, next. So briefly before uh, we begin, I would like to explain what we currently have and where we're headed, as well as why we're choosing to move in this direction. So currently most students enter high school after taking two years, seventh and eighth grade language into a leveled Spanish two or French two course. So it's CP1, CP, AE honors, and recommendations for placement are made in eighth grade for these particular courses. What we're proposing for next year is a single entry intermediate Spanish two and French two course, uh, intermediate low being the anticipated proficiency level of the students, and this will be an unleveled class. Um, placements for future leveled courses are to be made at the end of the intermediate Spanish two or French two, and for most students, this is at the end of their freshman year. Students never having taken a language follow a different sequence at the high school. Um, please advance the slide. Next. So why a single entry course? Um, in large part, this is, a, this is due to the pandemic. So we recognize that students are not engaging in the same amount of material and skill work as before as a result of the interruption in learning in the spring and our current pandemic schedule. Students' learning conditions have varied um, as well in their ability to fully engage during asynchronous days, and we want to be mindful of this. Just for some background, in order for students to move proficiency levels, experts share that one needs approximately 135 to 150 contact hours. Um, these contact hours at the high school level after a few years of study and building proficiency looks different than in early language learning. Students at the intermediate level are able to interact with interpretive readings and listening, more proficiency-based activities on asynchronous days, so it's easier to move students forward in a proficiency-focused manner. As a department, we have also observed that students this year in French 2 and Spanish 2 are showing similar strengths and areas of growth and skill areas regardless of the level in which they were placed. So considering this, we feel it would be most advantageous to allow students more time, more contact hours, building proficiency to grow and more accurate, accurately demonstrate their skills before being placed into a leveled course. We also feel quite prepared at the high school to work with students in a heterogeneous environment due to the high school world language curriculum changes. The ABRHS department, um, the World Languages Department at the high school has updated its curriculum over the last seven years from a grammar based model, the conjugating verbs, memorizing lists of vocabulary, to a more proficiency based model that focuses on, in on skill development, performance assessment, using everything in context, and really makes differentiation of material easier. I'm proud of the work that the department has done to develop thematic based units guided by can-do statements, a more strength-based approach, and its usage of authentic resources, articles, podcasts, commercials to support these themes. The department also utilizes a common skills-based rubric for grading. So students set goals throughout the year on skills appropriate for the student's developmental level, and teachers provide more individualized feedback based on these goals. Students also spend time reflecting throughout the year on their progress towards reaching these goals, and celebrating what they can do with the language. So the way that we, te that we teach now has changed quite a bit for the better and our focus is on real life communication. We value what they can do over their knowledge of the language since the change. 
Um, for example, um, how we might differentiate is really taking a look at our questioning techniques, which is something that we've done um, a lot of professional development on. So after viewing a short commercial, for example, you may ask students to list what they see. Uh, they might be asked to write a sentence, then ask a question, connect sentences, compare, and give opinions. And in this way, we can see students climbing the proficiency ladder. Um, and really, if students are hoping to push themselves, they certainly can. Um, I also would love to mention that we have a strong student mentoring program that will be helpful in supporting our students. Other considerations that we believe support this change, every year we collect survey data from our seniors and we have been involved in challenge success. So data collected from our senior survey shows that leveling uh, causes student stress, contributes to a negative self-image, a lot of times you'll have students refer to themselves as their level, I'm a CP student, and leveling results in less interaction among peers of different levels as they tend to travel together. And we believe this change would contribute to less competition, a stronger community working with diverse peers and better overall student wellness in their first year. Also noteworthy, our 2016 Challenge Success Survey data shows that on average, ninth and 10th graders report more academic worry than 12th graders. And we believe that less overall movement of classes, no need to change levels in their first year would result in more consistency for freshmen in their first year and an easier transition to high school. We also recognize and support the district's commitment to DEI work. And as the district engages in DEI work, research has shown that leveling plays a role in limiting academic opportunities for students of color, as well as low income and English language learners. So unleveling this first year, we believe will help play a role in leveling the playing field. It'll also add to consistency within the world language department because currently the world languages uh, department offers four languages, Spanish, French, Latin, and Chinese. Latin and Chinese both begin with a single entry unleveled high school course. So in a year where languages will become a graduation requirement, again, we are very excited about this. This change would bring consistency to the department overall and encourage students to choose their language based on interest and not levels offered. So it would help with their choice. And finally, we're excited to report that there is a 100% support by World Language Department members, as well as building leadership at the junior high school and high school for this change. Um, next. So to review our intended uh, impact, our hopes for this work, uh, more equitable, uh, equitable opportunities for students, especially after this last year, we'll be allowing all freshmen the necessary time to grow, mature, and more accurately demonstrate their ability and interest. And we're hoping we can even further ignite interest and excitement at the high school level with more choices and an exciting proficiency-based program. Easier mobility among levels, we believe this first year will help build more confidence, not defined by a level placement. There'll be less of a content difference as students move on to three and four. Once students are placed, um, they mostly stay in that placement. So this change will delay placement for one year for all students and give the same foundation to all of our language learners. Um, more access to AP courses. Um, delaying this placement will allow students more choice in whether an AP track is something that they would like to pursue. And I have a colleague in Hopkinton who has made this change and noted more students have stayed in their program longer. So we hope we see this as well. So if an AB class isn't something that's interesting to a student, staying in the program longer to build proficiency will give students access to the Apple and the Seal of Biliteracy in their senior year, which is a celebration of their dual language achievement at the state level. Um, a stronger sense of community and easier freshman transition. The adjustment would allow students to interact with a more diverse group of peers, allowing students to learn and grow together, inspire each other and model for one another. And all this we hope will contribute to a stronger sense of community. More consistency within the department and enhanced teacher collaboration. This would result in consistency of courses within the department and students being offered the opportunity to choose courses based on interest rather than level. And the consolidation of first year courses would enhance teacher collaboration with more teachers teaching this entry course. Um, next. 
So our next steps will involve uh, spring and summer curriculum work to prepare for these fall courses. We have adjusted a lot over the last couple years, but we would want to do some more work to ensure that we're providing opportunities to support all of our learners. And we would gather and analyze feedback from students and staff, uh, continue to survey. With the proficiency work that we've done, we've surveyed both students and teachers throughout the process. And we found the, positive, the changes to be very positive. We feel it's important to gather this feedback. Um, some of the feedback that we've gotten on our, our proficiency work has been that students feel the curriculum is more authentic, real life, based on individual growth, and that they are becoming better communicators. And that's what it's all about. So we look forward to seeing how this change will benefit both teachers and students and adjusting the areas um, as needed. Um, next. And in conclusion, these two posters are ones that we share with our students. The poster on the right is a reminder that language learning is a journey. And both are important to remember that it is progress over perfection during this journey and mistakes are essential. Um, a change such as this, as what we're proposing, takes a growth mindset and a belief that all students can do it. And this is something that we believe in our department and we look forward um, to your feedback. And thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you, Seneca. All right. So does anyone have questions for Seneca? If you use the hand raise feature, it's much easier for me to see. John? Thank you. And thank you, Tessa and Peter, for including this on the agenda, because, you know, obviously it doesn't require action on our part, but um, related to the diversity of the community, world language, you know, is very important to many, many community members. And I think communicating these changes and the philosophy around world language is very important. But as striking as all of that was, what was actually you know, most appreciated by me was your candor about the fact that we simply cannot provide the same language instruction, you know, particularly for people beginning the study of languages in this hybrid environment. And you know, I think you know, I'd love to be here and, you know, say that, well, we can do everything in this hybrid environment that we could do last year. And that just isn't true. Um, and I think everybody knows that it's not true, but I think everybody struggles to say it out loud. And you actually did. You were very clear. Um, so my question is, you know, and you particularly talked about in the early phases, you know, that the contact hours are important, some of the nature of what goes on in world language. So I'll ask a question in the form of the end of average. So you can't just tell me that I think, you know, my students made 80% of the progress they would have. I'd like you to, to talk about, you know, the students, you know, who have more difficulty with language and how this has impacted them, you know, students that were sort of average and the students that would be high achievers who, you know, progress quickly through language learning. So I, I think what we're finding is that with without the contact hours, you're you're seeing that the communication, you really the, the practice is so very important. So the students are having a harder time um, kind of making the language a part of them. So it's I, I think what they're what they're really missing is that is the communication piece. Evan? Thank you, Tessa. Uh, thank you, Seneca, uh, for your presentation. Actually, I like uh, the idea, like uh, uh, change for better. Basically, uh, you you guys uh, really explore the uh, other um, schemes to improve the to to benefit the students. Right. So, uh, so I have uh, just a few comments. One is uh, so originally we have uh, four levels, right, and that's. Uh, uh, so there got to be some reason to set up four levels, and so now is it gonna be just one level? Do you think that's uh, gonna be? I mean, students probably need some time to adapt to these changes, right? Uh, also, like you said, uh, the word language department is is gonna be busy in the spring and the summer to prepare the. Uh, change these changes so I, I just wonder if uh, do you have the competence uh, student and the t word language department uh, have this uh, uh, I mean can adapt to this change 
this I saw this is a pretty big change, like from four level to one level, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one. Second is, uh, uh, so I noticed that you're going to do better survey to sending out a survey to the student and the staffs. Uh, so maybe, I don't know if it make more sense also to let the I mean, community know, like the parents or so that's just my comments. Uh, so third one. So I see a lot of goodness, good good stuff about the changes. Right? That's changes for better. That's great. What are the limitations? Thank you for your for your questions and comments. Um, in terms of the confidence, I, I mentioned a little bit about the the work that we've been doing. So we have moved from a grammar based uh, model in, in over the past seven years have done a lot of work to move towards a more proficiency based model. And I think our um, our common rubric that we use and the professional development that we've done has really given people the confidence to make this change. I would say if I had asked um, and had this conversation with a department seven years ago, I don't know that we would have been as confident um, that we would be able to meet everyone's needs, but with the work that we've done and the ability to differentiate in the, the questioning techniques um, example that I gave to you, to be able to give one activity and measure um, or, or differentiate the, the activity for different students, that's all work that we've done over the last seven years. So I do believe that the department in, is, is very confident in this, in this change. Um, so I was, I was excited to, to see that. Um, I do, uh, with the, the surveys, we've made sure that we have surveyed throughout um, the work that we've done because we've, we've wanted to make sure that the, the changes we're making have felt positive. So surveying our students and our, our staff has been very important to us. And that's, that's why we're gonna continue to do that to make sure that we're you know, making changes or adjusting as needed. Um, and and I'll, I, I definitely have noted the, the community piece as well. Um, the I'm sure there there are definitely challenges to every change, and we're going to figure out what those are going to be. But we wholeheartedly believe that this change is going to um, that the benefits are are far going to are, are going to far outweigh any of the drawbacks. But I'm sure we'll we'll see those along the way. Thank you, uh, Diane. You you were up next. Yeah, th thank you very much. This was a really interesting presentation to read in the packet and and it was really interesting to hear what you had to say. I wish we could do more uh, with world language in the elementary level for sure. Um, so I have two questions where I have to get up and take care of my dog and I'm like just give me a second. <laughs> um, so is you are taking advantage of of something you've observed in the in the remote and the hybrid programs and, and making something really happen that's important from that. And I appreciate that. Is this something, maybe I missed it, but is this something you intend to continue beyond this year? That was one of my questions. Um, and the other thing is, you know, it made me think back to our, the school committee meeting on June 4th, 2020. And at that meeting, we voted to align the high school graduation requirements with mass core tenants for middle and high schools to set um, ambitious goals. And I went into the Mass Corps site and it um, it says that they want high schools and middle schools to set ambitious, ambitious goals to increase student participation in, in advanced placement courses, especially students from historically underserved groups and to address implicit bias and stereotypes about who takes advanced coursework and build school cultures and entrench the belief that all students can benefit from challenging coursework. And I was just so pleased to, to see that presentation because it lines right up with those tenants and that's what we all want. Um, my question is, um, how, you, know, you said you were, your job now with your team is to think about curriculum through the lens of intermediate language skills and that's different from looking at curriculum through the lens of honors, AE and CP. And I was wondering if you could just talk briefly about what that means. Um, so you have a couple questions there. Um, I think your your first was whether or not we hope to continue this um, in years to come. I think, you know, kind of looking at the presentation, we saw a need 
that this really needed to be done right now. Um, it is something that we've talked about as a department for for some time as well, because we do feel like there, you know, as, as I had discussed, that there are other benefits to this as well. We, we feel like students are with this first year and all the students having the same um, base, uh, it will it will certainly benefit all of them and give them more confidence and, and open up more opportunities for them moving forward. So we are hoping that we have more students stay in, in our language program because of this as well. Um, so in terms of the curriculum, some of the work that we'll be doing, I think we're going to continue with a lot of the proficiency work that we've done. I think what we've seen um, in the past with some of our, our, our coursework, um, some of our, there, our AP prep really does, you know, it begins mostly like when we head into the, the level three, a lot of the, the pre-AP work is, is simpler and it can be done with, with all students. So we know that, that, you know, that, that AP work for, for students doesn't, in a language, it doesn't start, it doesn't start in that last year. It begins from, from year one, right? Because they're, they're developing their proficiency all throughout. Um, what we've noticed is I think sometimes we look at um, and this is a change, and I think in, in our mindset, um, we've looked at honors, AECP as you know how much content we cover, and we've really changed the way we look at it is is more of the skill work that we do. And so I think that's what we're going to look at is is the skill work and in really delving deeper into um, the thematic units um, in order to achieve our goals. So it won't be so much covering content as really. Um, delving deeper into that skill work so that all of the students, regardless of, you know, how many themes they cover, have the necessary base to, to move on. And is this just this year? Oh. Or is this continuing going forward? Just this, just this year for this change or moving forward? So I, so I, I had just, I think I addressed that first. Um, so we are hoping, we saw the need right now um, it, it was kind of, you know, coming right at us, knowing that the students weren't getting as much of the contact hours with the communication, um, you know, building building their proficiency. And but it is something that we see would would be worthwhile for the students moving on, um, just looking at you know building the base for them and, and opening up more opportunities. So we are hoping it's something that um, we continue with. But you know, a, as we had mentioned, we're going to you know survey staff and and, and our students uh, to see if that is beneficial to them. Thank you. All right, Angie, I'm going to call on you. And then after that, I'm going to ask that anyone else hold their comments if you come up with something after Angie asks, because we're quite a bit behind in our schedule. So um, Angie, go right ahead. You're muted. Yeah, thank you, Tessa. And thank you, Sinika. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so we're gonna just could clarify on Diane's question. So we're gonna evaluate, do a survey at this the end of this year to see how this program works, right? Yeah, so I mean it is it is something that we've put in as a change. We're hoping that that it's something that's beneficial moving forward. Um, we were anticipating on on changing it back. I think this is something that that will take the students a couple years. If you're thinking of at least students in seventh and eighth grade, um, you know, moving forward, they're going to need a couple years to really build, um, you know, get the kind of proficiency work that they had had before. But we do see that that there are lots of other benefits to this change as well. So, but we will continue to to survey our students and staff to see if if what we're doing is working for them. Okay, so you mentioned about the skill work. Do is there a, like a evaluation and how do you kind of understand how this go, how, how good they learn their school work that you anticipated? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's all a part of the, the work that we've done. We've done a lot of, um, a lot of work over the last, um, seven years in, in really kind of rebuilding, reworking our curriculum into these thematic units, um, performance assessments, how, how well they can utilize, uh, what they're learning, right? So what they're learning about the language in context, being able to communicate. But one of the big pieces that we worked on is, is building a common um, proficiency rubric that takes the students um, throughout their high school career, right? So we're able to watch them grow in their proficiency. And that's uh, that's that's what we kind of build the, the skill work off of. So that's been all a part of the work that we've done over the last seven years. It's helped us prepare for for this change. 
Okay, so there's a proficiency uh, rubrics that you use to evaluate mm -hmm. for the evaluation. Yes. And that would be that would be kind of benchmark how how each student is progressing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And a big part of that is is you know the performance assessments that we give the kids, but we also have them do a lot of self evaluating and checking in on the goals that they're setting and you know we're setting together. It it has allowed us to give a lot more individualized feedback. Um, I think looking at you know the, the old tests that we used to give of where they had to kind of spit back. Um, content of vocabulary and grammar, we don't test like that anymore. It's really how they are able to utilize um, that grammar and vocabulary in context. And, and that's what we've we've done the, the professional development on over the last, last couple of years. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that great presentation. That was really interesting and a nice break from many of the other things that we've had to talk about. Deb, did you have something that you wanted to add? Yeah, just really quickly. Um, Seneca was able to share with me um, the results are after talking to her staff, her department. Um, I just want to point out that it's a rarity to get 100% of all staff excited and eager to do this work and to make this change. And I just want to say it's because of Seneca's leadership and the work that she's done over the last seven years with her department. So thank you for that. It's a really terrific team. Thank you. That was really enlightening and, and makes me excited about some of the changes, how this reflects some of the changes that we've talked about as a committee that we want to make. So thank you for the presentation. Thanks for having me tonight. Thank you so much, Seneca. Thanks, Seneca. All right. So it's 8.08, and we had uh, planned to start the next presentation at 7.40, just to give you just to give you an idea of, of how long things take. So just to give you some perspective, the next thing is the superintendent's preliminary FY22 budget, and um, after that, there's a budget subcommittee update, an ALG update, and a BLF update, and all of those were supposed to be over by 825. So just take that into consideration when we ask questions. And I'm not suggesting that you, you know, don't ask questions because this is like the biggest thing that we need to tackle as a school committee. I just want you to be aware of the time and listening to your fellow committee members and listening for questions that you may have asked and then you don't need to. So, um, I think we're expecting I'm about 20 minutes is what we had talked about with the slide. So we can watch and see if Dave and Peter go over their 20 minutes, but that's what, that's what we had roughly planned for. So um, go right ahead. Oh, thank you. And I, I actually think we may end up being a little less than 20 minutes. So, you know, before I start um, going through the budget presentation, I just want to acknowledge this is a little bit different um, budget than some that you may have seen before. Um, we felt like we wanted to take a little different approach for a couple of reasons. One, as we've worked with the committee over the last few years, I think there was an increased desire to have more input earlier in the budget process um, around what, what things looked like as they played out over time. But then second, you know, we recognize that we're in a very unique position where, you know, from a school pressure standpoint, we're looking at recovery from the pandemic with a degree of uncertainty around that. And from a community pressure standpoint, we're looking at um, a financial picture that, you know, certainly needs to take into account the understanding that one of our communities is closer at the levy limit um, and doesn't have the capacity to increase taxes. And we also really have to take into account impact on individual community members um, and their ability to pay increased taxes. So um, we wanted to take a little bit different of approach and, you know, hopefully walk you through that tonight and then solicit some feedback. So. I'm going to go ahead and start the presentation. There we go. So some of the goals we have for tonight. Uh, we want to review the timeline and the process for budget adoption. We want to make sure everyone is on the same page about what's happening and when. We want to make sure there's an understanding among the committee, all of you as committee members, of what the major budget drivers are, what our fixed costs are, and the implications of something called a level service budget. And we'll talk about that more. We wanna give you a high level overview of the FY22 budget. And this is only a preliminary presentation and it will change and continue to evolve over the next several weeks. Finally, we want to hear feedback from you about the approach that we take um, within the next steps of the budget because there are some options. And in all honesty, I think for us as a leadership team, we need to hear from you, uh, who are, are obviously important link with the community, um, 
some general ideas about how you want us to think about the next step of development. So just to review, you know, there is a series of five presentations that we provide to the full committee and there are budget subcommittee meetings in between most of these. So there end up being quite a few different presentations that take place. This is the preliminary budget overview. We talk about our budget guidelines and district goals. We will talk about preliminary revenues and budget drivers, um, aspects of what a level service budget looks like, you know, the overall budgetary impact on reserves and preliminary assessments. This is not the presentation to get into the weeds of the budget. That will come later, certainly. Um, we'll come back to you on February 4th with a second round, which then becomes the first version of my recommended budget. So it's not preliminary. That becomes a first version of a recommended budget. You will uh, be getting line item detail of the budget. We'll be talking more about all day kindergarten um, and asking you to vote the tuition for that. Um, you'll hear a little bit about it tonight, but we will ask you to make sure you vote the tuition for that. Um, and you'll also hear more details about capital improvement projects and the funding of those projects. We will then come back on February 11th with our third presentation, which is another version of the superintendent's recommended budget that it does evolve based on your feedback. Um, and at that meeting, we would ask you to take a preliminary budget vote. Um, that needs to be at least 20 days before the expected final budget vote per the regional agreement. So there are some timelines that are, you know, hard and fast based on different agreements we have. Um, the fourth presentation is on March 4th. That is a comprehensive, comprehensive budget and program presentation. In past years, that was the traditional budget Saturday. We recognize in the land of Zoom, the traditional budget Saturday we've run may not be the most effective means. So we are doing that on a Thursday night. Um, it is in lieu of the traditional Saturday presentation, but if you watched in past years, you will expect some of the same features. Of it. And then finally, we'll come back on either March 11th or 18th with our fifth and final presentation. And that is our final budget recommendation. It's also our public hearing that is required by law on the proposed FY22 budget. And we would ask you to vote that final budget time. So some important dates. Um, we always work backwards on our timing of the budget process from various town meetings because those are our key benchmarks. Foxborough Town Meeting begins May 10th, 2021. We don't have any information that that's likely to change, so we just want to make sure we're aware of that. Um, that's different than usual. Um, usually the dates in Acton are the budget drivers. Um, so one consideration that certainly is important for us is as we work through the ALG process, you know, our representatives to ALG are going to need to keep in mind that ALG doesn't have the full normal time it might take to be able to come to agreement because Boxborough is going to vote on this budget first and we need to respect their timelines. Act in time meeting will begin in June. We don't yet have a date for that. Um, and then as we do our budget timelines, we do count back from those two town meetings. Um, as I said before, you know, we have the final budget vote can either be on March 11th or 18th with a public hearing on the budget and an opportunity for community comment. That needs to be 45 days before the earliest town meeting. And in order to approve the budget, it is done by a two thirds of weighted votes, votes of the full school committee. So that is where the weighting of, of different members comes into play. Um, and then budget program presentation, we plan March 4th in preliminary school committee vote February 11th so that we can hit that 25 day before the budget deadline. And that vote in the preliminary vote is a simple majority of members from each town. So before we start, I wanted to frame a couple of questions I would like to pose uh, because I think we need some important feedback in these areas. You're certainly welcome to stray from you know the, the beaten path here. Um, but sometimes I think it's helpful to frame why we need some feedback. So the overarching question we need to strike as a district, I think, is what is the right balance around meeting students' post-pandemic educational needs and the financial impact of our budget on the communities? Um, and some minor questions that come up, not in, unimportant, but minor questions to that are what are the post-pandemic restorative needs our students will have? What might need to be added or increased from what we currently have? Um, what is the financial impact to the communities? And what is the appropriate level of reserve usage? So just um, a couple of big questions to frame this. Uh, we had more questions and then we said that's not gonna, not gonna work for this. Um, so budget guidelines, I just wanna review these um, and you can take a moment 
to read along. Um, these were adopted by our school committee um, several weeks ago, so it's important to just refresh our memory. But we do want to develop a flexible budget that's responsive to uncertainty caused by the pandemic and allows for a variety of educational models next year. We need to assume uncertainty with regard to state and federal funding for schools. You will certainly hear that repeated several times. We want to adequately fund education programs uh, designed to expedite recovery from the pandemic and ensure effective services and supports are in place for all students, social and emotional needs um, and academic needs, excuse me. We want to evaluate opportunities to use existing resources to align services and supports across the district in a fiscally sustainable manner um, that is responsive to the economic needs of the community. Consider funding directly allocated to programs that support students with IEPs, English learners, students whose families may be income insecure, students of color, or other groups who may have been dis disproportionately impacted by the pandemic and school closures. Prioritize anti-bias, anti-racist strategic initiatives. Evaluate kindergarten enrollment projections carefully. Um, we've started to talk about that. We want to evaluate all-day K tuition in light of the presumed resumption of all-day K next year. We want to maximize opportunities to leverage alternate revenue sources, including but not limited to state and federal grants. Monitor the strategic use of reserves in light of economic uncertainty and evaluate strategies to replenish revolving accounts that have been negatively impacted by pandemic related costs and reduced revenues. And then finally, we want to also resume funding of our capital improvement plan in order to fully implement planned improvements. There's a lot of stuff um, in two pages to, to keep track of. I will tell you up front, we did not get to everything in this first version of a preliminary budget. Um, we will continue to hone that, but there were some items that we felt like we wanted to come to you first with kind of the realities of our budget to learn some more direction before we now go back and, and continue to progress toward these, these goals. I'm going to turn it over to Dave, and he's going to talk about some revenues and budget drivers. Thank you. I, I'm pretty sure you can hear me. I apologize for unmuting before when I thought I did the opposite. Um, pictorially, this is what the revenue picture looks like. Um, Peter, Peter had this uh, slide last year, so we've had a couple of slides that you may recognize from last year. Um, last year, new revenues declined, but there was still new revenue. There was still a half a million dollars or more of budgeted new revenue at this point in time. Not so next year. Um, you'll see in the memo, and I'm, I'm sorry we didn't provide that until today, but the detailed breakdown of FY22 revenue at this point is uh, is in the memo, and we're expecting less new revenue next year, le a decline in revenue uh, next year versus this year. Primarily, this is a teaser because I'll come back to this, um, the difference being transportation aid is expected to be significantly less next year. I'll, I'll get into why. A couple of years back, we were nearly a million dollars more revenue. A couple of things that, that were the case then that aren't now. We were in a period where we added transportation costs the prior year, and the transportation aid being a reimbursement program, we reaped a benefit in revenue in FY20. We were conservative in budgeting for Chapter 70 aid. The SOA had not yet passed, and we, we took a conservative approach to new Chapter 70 money. And in addition, we, were, we had been even more conservative in other revenue, interest and Medicaid. And I used to use the phrase, we're chasing those, where they were not budgeted at all as revenues before I came to the district. And they had been increasing for several years. We bumped up, we provided for, and then continued to bump up the revenue budget projections. And um, I think it's safe to say that both of those sources of revenue have, we've chased them and we've caught them from, from FY22. Reminder, the, re the reason that this slide should, should be prominent in your, in your head, the change in the budget, so what we propose is a change to the budget, to the, to the appropriation, minus the change in revenue, and you can see that the, that the difference here is a negative, minus the change in reserves, that math equation results in the change in the assessment. So all other things being equal, a decline in revenues equals an increase in assessment. Next slide. 
we talk about the the impact of there are there are five basic categories which we call major budget drivers salaries middlesex county retirement out of district tuition health insurance and we've combined capital and debt typically uh um personnel costs are the are the lion's share the biggest share of the pie what i've done here is shown between FY20 and 22, and there's a reason I, I picked a two-year gap, the relative slices of the budget pie of these major categories. There are some there are some changes that look on its surface, well, you know, 8.4 to 7.9 percent for tuition. That's that's a positive thing because the pie has gotten bigger, um, as you can see pictorially. And as a relative share, out of district tuition is less. And, and as the, the first first blush for FY22 is out of district tuition ha will decrease next year. Something like the, the purple slice, so capital and debt. I went back to 21 because if we look at 21 to 22, that slice is going to be relatively constant. But 20 predates the bond issuance for the new school. So you can see that as a relative share of the budget, capital and debt has increased between the two years. The disregard, if you will, the, the comment in the left margin, I don't believe that's accurate, uh, yeah. but the comment in the bottom right that these five budget drivers represent um, a little less than 90% two years ago, a little more than 90% prospectively for next year of the total budget. So looking at these components, you get a, you get a significant handle on the overall budget. Next slide. So we've, we've taken again a slide that was in last year's presentation that Peter did uh, 20 versus 21. We kept those two components and slid in a column for FY22. You can see that the categories are in the gray boxes at each end. The number inside them is how much in dollars each, each year represented in the budget. The blue, green, and red represent the percentage increases. Uh, the blue we look at as, as a pretty no, pretty normal uh, increase and not not worthy of discussion uh, here. I'm going to I'm going to focus quickly on the green and the red. So health insurance we had our second year yeah. of declining rates in FY20. Since then. Health insurance has done what it does for for governments generally, and that's go up by four to five percent. Um, mass Middlesex County retirement, we had an unusually large assessment um, projected for us next year. I'm not going to get into the details here, but that I troubleshot that increase, and believe it or not, that primarily relates to the increase in bus drivers and other staff in 2019. It's taken, it's taken that long to bleed its way through the Middlesex County assessment formula, but it's an unusually large increase uh, from what's typically a 6.5% increase. Capital and debt, it's a 6% increase, what that represents is our resumption of the CIP program, as we'll talk about, where we, we only spent last year on the first year of the CIP bond. Next year, we're proposing to go back to spending new appropriated money on capital projects. And out-of-district tuition has bounced around a little bit. You can see in 20, the, the cost was, was down from the prior year. Last year, it was back up again and projected for next year down again. That's really good news. Uh, a category of nearly $8 million had that minus 2.9 and a plus 5.3 as in the prior year, we'd be talking a lot more serious predicament um, as far as what we do with this project. Uh, comment on one thing while you're there. Yes. Can you comment on the, you mentioned the 5.9% on capital, but I'm sure a question is going to arise. So maybe just a real quick overview of 66% and 105% because those are oh, Yes. So 66% relates to a couple of years ago when we were still in the process of ramping up our 
capital appropriation uh, to $1 million. And so between debt service and capital, uh, that accounted for the increase in that year. On top of that, for FY21, is when the first year of the, of the twin school came online. So we're, we are paying that for the first time this year. And so those two should be understood by people who, who've been around, who've been in town, understanding that we were in a, in a multi-year uh, phase in to ramp up capital spending. And then uh, just the, the, the unique piece was the new funding, uh, the funding of the new school that began this year, FY21. Yeah. And one comment I'll just add on out of district tuitions uh, for new members. This is normally a very volatile area of the budget. Um, you know, we serve a large number of students in our district whose needs exceed the capacity of our classrooms and programs within the district. Um, and it's very, very important that we continue to serve all of our students well, uh, regardless of their educational need. So, you know, there are times when we have to place a student in a program outside of our district. Um, tuitions for out of district programs can range anywhere from $60,000 a year all the way up to $300,000 a year or more uh, based on whether or not the placement requires a residential component to it. Um, so sometimes there could be a situation where we have two students move into our district um, who need residential placements and we could see a $600,000 split in the budget within one year. So just keep in mind, you know, fluctuation within out of district tuitions is normal, it's expected, um, and it's really important to make sure we continue to honor the needs of those students. So before, if you can go back, Peter, we just want to we just want to touch quickly on the yellow box that we added. Where do we have leverage? So keep in mind the questions that Peter posed to you before. Some of these categories we don't have leverage with. Health insurance is a function of who who's el how many eligible employees do we have? Do they opt into the insurance program? What's the rate that's set by the health insurance trust? Out of district tuition. Don't have any leverage there. We can, we're can we estimating uh, placements based on IEPs that we know right now. Uh, it's way in advance. It's, it's fraught with, um, uh, with, with uncertainty a year and a half from now when next fiscal year ends. But th there's, not, there's no leverage as far as uh, making strategic changes to that number. Salaries, we could make we could take action relative to positions that are that are currently in the budget and so there's some leverage there middlesex county uh i talked about the unusualness of the assessment increase for fy22 we're going to propose at some point uh, a strategy for normalizing the middlesex county assessment and capital and debt we have leverage there because we did so last year. We had we teed up uh, an appropriation, and by the time the final budget got voted, all of the new capital appropriation had been deferred. So we zeroed it out. We're hoping that's not the case this year. Um, but in addition, we will present um, a means of funding some of that increase. That's that's not in here. This is just the cost side. So where do we have leverage should be a question that you ask yourself when you go back and think about answering the questions that Peter posed before. Okay. So as I said before, you know, what we want to share with you tonight is only preliminary and we're choosing to only show right now what a level service budget would look like. Um, so I want to highlight some of those and in the next iteration, we'll certainly be making revisions to this. But we want to show this first because we want you to understand the impact of just keeping our services level with what we're offering this year um, and to get feedback from you about next steps. So to do a level service budget, by definition, a level service budget takes all of the services we currently offer and rolls them forward by a year. Um, so if we offer it this year, we offer it next year. If we project class sizes at a certain level this year, we do the same next year. Um, we offer the same programs, opportunities, everything else that we would currently be offering. Um, in a level service budget, we have to account for our major budget drivers, which are cost increases or decreases as we detail. Um, and as you just saw, we 
in this budget are maintaining the same services as we have currently. However, this budget does show a reduction of one um, elementary classroom teacher, which we knew was coming based on projected decreases in enrollment. Um, that's been coming for several years. It just has worked its way through the system. Um, and that keeps class sizes within the guidelines that we establish um, and projects for enrollment. In addition, we reduce one FTE district position. That position was eliminated this current year after our budget was approved. So we had an opportunity to try to be more efficient in the district offices as we began this year. We took advantage of that, and that is now accounted for in the next year's level service budget already. So otherwise, though, we returned the staff levels assumed in the FY21 budget, and that means pre-pandemic staffing levels. Um, we did increase a number of positions just due to the pandemic. If you recall, we added about 14 positions just for this year. Um, we are not carrying those positions heading into next year at this point. Um, we have no other personnel additions being proposed in this budget. So overall, what we're looking at is in addition to the one-year positions that we hired for this year, right now we're looking at a net reduction of two FTV going into the level service budget. This budget also resumes appropriated funding of the capital improvement plan. Um, if you recall, and as Dave said, last year we had a temporary hiatus from funding that. We thought it was important in the first budget iteration to get back to what we said we were planning to do. Um, so you're going to see that. Uh, it also assumes $965,000 use of E&D, which is a $180,000 reduction from FY21. We wanted to start with the goal of re re reducing our reliance on excess and deficiency to budget. And if we want to add it back, we want that to be an intentional decision that we make. Um, it also assumes strategic reserves of uh, some of our other reserves, and we'll be talking about those later. So if we do all of that that I just detailed, that is a $3.6 million increase or a 3.73% increase on the current year's budget. So we don't add anything new. We reduce a couple of positions. Um, we resume funding of capital. We use about $200,000 less in E&D heading into next year. Um, and we think about how we could use other uh, reserves strategically. So just keep that in mind, please. That's 3.73% on the budget, 3.6 million. Dave, I'll turn it back to you. Back to me. So I won't beat this to death. This is just in pictures, the changes for the last couple of years. The blue, the blue bars are added staff in FTE. The red bars are added cost in dollars. Um, the, the increase in cost in FY22, while, while FTE is not going up, it's a result of existing contract adjustments that are, that are built into the cost structure. Of the average, average increase over three years, 3.9%. Next, next one's a little busy. I'll try and explain and decipher the spaghetti there. It's... A, if, if I do this right, you'll, you'll get it really quickly. So I'm going to walk through the four lines. The blue line is the original CIP plan. And so it's, so it's spending all the way back from FY16. We started with only $100,000 annually of capital appropriations. We got to FY20 and we were up to $1,250,000. And at that point, issued the uh we issued the the 10-year cip bond which is the green line in fy21 but otherwise spent no more money on capital this year so so the blue line was supposed to go down to 500,000. in reality we zeroed out the line to pass the budget last year so the divergence between original plan and reality one year in is the blue line and the red line in FY21. So the so my objective was how do we get back on track so that the total amount of spending that was called for in that CIP plan over 13 years gets back gets back on track and we spend the same amount of dollars. And so you can see how we've it, we've ramped it up and so the red line is the is the alternative plan if you will. 
and it's a steeper slope than the blue line, original blue line had been, meaning that we're going to ramp up spending at a quicker pace to catch up and then go past the blue line. And this works out mathematically, but the area under the blue line and the area under the red line are the same, meaning we, by the time we get to year 13, we spend the same amount of dollars. And for purposes of illustration, well, how much money are we spending as a district? That's the purple line. And so the purple line starts this year with um, only spending on the CIP, uh, on the CIP bond, but thereafter, it's the, it's the CIP bond plus the revised plan. So if you will, the green plus the red going forward is the purple. So once again, blue line is our original spending under the CIP. And you can see that it was a modest increase. It was expected to increase by two and a half percent or the, or thereabouts per year. And then go up significantly when the bond was paid off in FY30. We got a year behind by zeroing it out in FY21. The red line seeks to pick it up and revisit the overview of the plan, the ultimate goals of the plan. Hopefully that's, not sure if it's worth a thousand words, but hopefully pictorially that's that's easy to grasp. Um, you see these all the time, the, the balance of E&D e frames the discussion uh, this element of reserves is decreasing a bit, primarily because we've used more uh, E&D to, to fund the budget for the last couple of years, couple of years. We'll have more details during subsequent budget presentations of E&D and all the reserves and how they relate to the total budget. Two other reserves that we're, that we're talking about this year that we've not talked about before as far as, as, far as actually funding the budget. One is the transportation stabilization account. It was approved several years ago, but never had been funded. We're looking at spending less money on transportation costs this year because of the pandemic. Ridership is down, cost of service is down. The state aid for transportation is a reimbursement program. So if we spend less this year, we'll get less next year. If you remember back at the, in the revenue discussion, I'm expecting less revenue next year. That's mostly a reduction in estimated transportation aid. So what we thought we would do is to take the estimate is $200,000 of expected savings for FY21 and transfer it to this stabilization fund and thereby provide a revenue source for next year to make up for the expected loss of state transportation aid. We could do nothing, and the, and that transportation surplus would fall to E and D. But what we're trying to do is to be transparent and keep like items the same. And if it's if it's transferred to the stabilization fund, it can only be used for that purpose. The other one is the capital stabilization fund. Now, this one was established two years ago, and it was funded. There's been a million dollars sitting there plus the amount that it's been earning in interest since that time. Um, it was proposed as a mean, uh, among other things, obviously as a reserve for unforeseen uh, needs, but as a means of smoothing out funding wrinkles, if you will, in the CIP plan. We're proposing a restoration of $345,000 in capital spending, new appropriations in FY22. That can, that can be done by adding $345,000 to our budget request, or what we're proposing is to take, to draw down $150,000 from the million plus in the stabilization fund and offset the budget impact of restoring the $345,000 to the plan. Will be we have I have developed um, a multi-year model of of drawing down from the stabilization fund, and I'll tell you it says the revised plan would draw down from the stabilization fund over three years and replenish by 2026. The magic of that year is that the debt service for the junior high and the high school projects 
will have been retired. And so there'll be a budget surplus, a year to year budget surplus uh, available to restore the capital uh, stabilization fund to its original to its original uh, status as of now. So, you, Peter. Yeah, so, uh, you know, a couple of things. Talk about kindergarten for a moment. Um, so if you remember from last year, just want to go, go back a year, um, we came to understand through a pretty detailed analysis that our operating budget just couldn't support an immediate move to free tuition, free all day kindergarten. Uh, we also looked at the notion that relying completely on excess and deficiency would compromise our reserves. Um, and the school committee last year voted to reduce all day K tuition by $750, which ended up being an amount of 3750 So that was planned for the current year we're in. Um, but then COVID. And so it, we did not end up offering all day kindergarten this year. Um, and so we had no revenue for all day K this year. So um, what we are recommending for next year is to resume tuition um, at set at 3750 which honors last year's school committee vote and kind of holds it there. Um, we, at this point, don't believe we have any revenues that would be able to offset any additional decrease in that. Um, we will continue to offer scholarships, as we always have, to make sure that any family who wants all day K but cannot afford it financially has access to it. Um, in addition, we want to continue to just put on the radar that we want to revisit tuition levels in the future as economic conditions do allow. So where are we at? Um, again, in the overall timeline of this, this is the preliminary budget presentation. Uh, we want some feedback from you tonight. Uh, we will be reviewing that with our administrative team, um, you know, beginning next week. Um, January 27th is an important date because that's the date the governor's budget is expected to be released. Uh, and we will be coming back to you on February 4th with the superintendent's recommended budget. We also have a budget subcommittee meeting scheduled for February 1st, just to, to note that. Um, some other considerations, um, we will be considering that your feedback, we will review our priorities with our leadership team. We certainly are working, um, you know, steadily to try and identify any ways that we can streamline our operations heading into next year. and. We also need to continue to work through various processes to understand the impact of our budget increase on the member community's assessments, uh, because that's ultimately the impact of taxpayers. So again, we want some feedback from you on tonight's presentation around kind of for our goals. Um, it's that overarching question of what's the right balance around meeting our students' needs coming back from the pandemic and the financial impact on our, of our budget on the community. So if you can help us with that, we will feel like we have a pretty good direction for our next steps. Um, I went through some of the other questions and, you know, we'll be bringing this back, obviously, to any more work we do over the next week, the budget subcommittee on February 1st. And then immediately after that, what we do, we present to budget sub first, get some feedback from the budget sub, and then we revise it that day and try and post it that night or the next day for you. Um, just so you understand how we work through a process here. So the big picture. Uh, Dave, do you want to talk through these numbers or do you want me to? Um, the numbers can speak for themselves, but I'm going to call back to something I said a few minutes ago, and that is if you look at the preliminary level services budget, third line, percent increase from prior year, 3.7%. It's actually, it's actually 3.73 for what it's worth. Um, a 3.73% budget increase results in a preliminary assessment, the last two lines, of over 4% and nearly 6% for Acton and Boxborough, respectively. And that's because we, of what I said before, budget, change in budget, minus change in revenues, minus change in reserves, equals change in assessment. And so if we're not having revenue growth, and you can see revenue offsets is less, um, the the assessment go, will go up at a higher rate than the budget goes up, and that's that's the predicament that that we are in. Yep. 
everything that we've shown there otherwise are just the, the some of the charts didn't have dollar values on them they're shown here and I guess the last piece is for the Boxborough members we have been we have been forecasting this that the uh, enrollment has been trending toward increasing the proportion favoring Boxborough meaning meaning a higher proportion the assessment is based on the a historical average so the last three years by town and so the data would suggest that Boxborough's share of the assessment will will increase at a higher rate than Acton's at least for the next couple of years and if I can just point one thing out to you if you look at the assessments from last year uh, particularly I think these three numbers should stand out these in particular are driven very largely by that first year of the new school day. Um, if you looked at the, um, the percent budget increase without school debt, Dave, what did we have last year? It was two. Well, the, the school debt was three and a half million. So that's a little over three and a half percent. So it would have been less than 3% yeah, for, the, for, the right, for the other budget. We've had some things really break our way over the last few years. Um, and, and we've had, you know, outside of the school debt, We've had pretty modest assessment increases um, that are way outside the norm of the history of assessment increases um, on the low side. And so, you know, this for a variety of reasons is certainly, you know, primarily around the reduced uh, revenues we're expecting is an increase on the other in the other way. So we want to be we want to be talking about that. A um, couple other things that we just want to touch base on. You know, federal stimulus. Dave, you want to talk briefly about this? So, the, so this is just we try, we try and do things in pictures for when we when we can just for uh, just for presentation value. And these you can see on the left are the five different funding sources we've had so far, and how much money has been made available. And it's it's to this point, it's about two and a half million dollars worth of federal funding. But it's all it's all spoken for. It's not going to the bottom line. It won't it won't reside in, in E and D. It's been it's been utilized mostly for technology and personnel. Um, the the um, costs relating to the remote program and the device costs related and, and other techno technological uh, needs relating to uh, providing providing remote learning. I'm going to go off script here because Peter, as, as earlier this evening, I got an email from our FEMA, actually our MEMA rep, um, and in the body of his email, this will be quick, it looks like there are going to be some huge changes to FEMA eligibility. He said that in his email. And what was attached that I needed to, I needed to log in to get it is, is a report called National Strategy for the COVID-19 Response and Pandemic Preparedness issued by President Joseph R. Biden Jr. on January 20th, 2021. So 200 pages long, I, I read a couple of sections where it talks about directing FEMA to fully reimburse states for the cost of emergency supplies including emergency supplies like PPE for school and child care providers. When last we met, uh, and by we, I mean the FEMA, the FEMA rep and me, the requirements were getting much stricter by FEMA on what they would, what they would reimburse. This looks to be uh, a change in that regard. And then the next, there's, a, there's another one that talks about the level of spending, uh, a hundred, at least $130 billion in funding dedicated to schools, $350 billion in flexible and local relief funds that will help districts avoid layoffs, close budget, close budget gaps, et cetera. 200 pages worth. There's a lot of reading there, but it looks as though uh, the, the incoming administration does mean business as far as providing COVID-related relief, uh, financial relief to cities, towns, districts. So, more to come on that. So we have to also, because, you know, it's, you know, we're not 
completely out of it in 2020 at this point. Um, but a few things, you know, we still have a lot of unknowns with some potential impact on the budget. Uh, and I don't know when these are going to get resolved, but we have to be mindful of them. Uh, first is additional stimulus funding. And that this is a positive one. Um, ESSER 2 is being released and pending distribution from the state. We don't yet know the amount. Uh, we are anticipating somewhere in the four hundred to four hundred and fifty thousand dollar range, possibly right in between those two numbers. Um, so that's a positive, um, and that's direct to school districts. We know that the federal stimulus package that's being proposed by the Biden administration um, includes a significant, significant increase in uh, monies for schools, but that's only in the proposal stage right now, and that has to make its way through Congress, be negotiated, um, and more to come there. And then the state would have to figure out what it's doing with the money and how it will be distributed. Um, we have the governor's proposed budget coming up. We have a question. Are we going to have a need for a remote learning program in FY22? We still just don't know the answer to that right now. Um, and that's something we're going to have to work through. We don't know what our COVID-related costs are going to be. Um, we are enrolled and working in, through the state's program uh, for the testing program. Um, we also, we've been in touch with numerous districts who have had some experience with that. Not all are happy with some vendors. So, you know, we know the state's testing program would certainly save us six weeks of cost, but um, we also know other districts have abandoned that vendor because they don't think it's particularly effective. So we have some, some research to do around that, and, but we are working toward a testing program that we are hoping to have up and running within the next month or so um, to six weeks. So more to come on that, and there are certainly costs, but I do think heading into next year, our ability to have students fully back in person is probably going to rely on us being able to have a good handle on, you know, how many students may be asymptomatic in the school, because they will not necessarily have access to vaccines. Um, we also don't know what our final costs for summer programming that is currently under development will be. Um, we are anticipating a much more robust summer program um, focused on, you know, academics, enrichment activities for all of our students, you know, from our youngest students right through high school students. Um, we know from an academic standpoint, we will likely um, foot the bill for that type of a program um, for our students who need it the most because it's the right thing to do. Um, so we don't know the cost of that yet. That could be $75,000 to $100,000 um, right at the beginning of FY22. Um, and then we also don't know the costs for um, the DEI consulting organization that I mentioned, um, but we do want to use them for our own strategic development. I've discussed the idea of leadership coaching uh, with them as well so that our leaders have effective coaching access um, so they can continue this work in all of our buildings. Um, and also on the community outreach portion of that. You know, we're certainly working with both towns, but we will have some portion of that that we want to be able to fund. So we're waiting for the final proposal from them uh, that we can now start to have, have more firm discussions. I expect it in the morning. They just didn't have it ready for tonight. So uh, those are the, you know, some of the big, big unknowns that we have. So at this point, we'll turn it over to you for, you know, preliminary questions. And then again, hopefully some feedback that can give us you know, a real good sense of direction about what you'd like to see out of this next iteration. Peter, can you stop sharing your screen so that I can see everybody? I can. Thank you. Okay. So, Peter's less than 20 minute presentation took 45 minutes. <laughs> good job, Peter. <laughs> um, so, I just want to make everyone aware because we were 25 minutes behind and then the 20 minute presentation took twice as long as we thought it was going to take. That's, it's okay, but we have an executive session scheduled at the end of the meeting. So I just want to make everyone aware of that. It is totally important for us to get the feedback that Peter and Dave are seeking um, so that they have appropriate ways to move forward and start to think about this budget. But if you are a new member and that was so far over your head and you have absolutely no idea what we were talking about, it's okay. Just stay and listen. And there is time for those kinds of clarifications clarification questions after the meeting. <laughs> um, Kira? I, I guess what I want to know is if I do have 10 million questions, it's within the rules to send an email to Peter and Dave, yes? And yeah. the feedback can go to Peter and Dave in an email, yes? Yeah, of course. It's 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 going to the group 
of us that can't happen. Like that, that's the only concern. No, go right ahead. And that's an appropriate way. If you have tons of questions, especially if they are clarification questions to do that. You know, my first year I had absolutely no idea. Amy, are you also, Tessa, very open to doing a budget tutorial for new members. Right. And that's something that we had talked about with Dave. That's all I wanted to say is that Dave is planning a a one-on-one or one-on three people to discuss the budget. Okay. So I just wanted to frame it. And so I appreciate that I see that Adam and John have used their little hand raise features. Um, So that's the easiest way for me to see everybody. I am going to stick you to one question and that includes comments. So no five comments and then a question at the end of it. Okay. Adam, go ahead. Mine is a brief comment just to share with the committee and the community as a whole that, um, you know, this is ongoing work of the, the budget subcommittee. This presentation um, was reviewed by both myself and John prior to coming to the committee as a whole. We're definitely under a compressed timeline this year, and so we're trying to do our best to make sure that um, we meet our timeline, but that the budget subcommittee gets some opportunities to review it as well. So uh, that, that's my only comment. John and I have looked at this already. We've provided some feedback, and I'm curious to, to hear feedback from other members of the committee as well. John, you're the only other person with a hand up, so go ahead. I'll... Um, if if you're really serious about a single comment, I will make one single comment, um, and that will relate to the issue of reserves. So you showed a chart of reserves, which showed in 2014 and 2015, the budget, you know, proposed the use of a million dollars of reserve, and yet you returned 1.6 or whatever, because the E&D position went up. So it's simply, you know, nonsensical to talk about the reserves that are in the budget without the talking about the net use of reserves that we're going to hear. And so the things that follow from that logically are that before we get to FY22, we will close FY21 and we will return something back between zero and some number, you know, which we should estimate. Um, And, you know, I think that's the context, you know, in which we should look at reserves. I'm impressed, John, that you could actually limit it to one. Thank you. I appreciate it. (laughs) Does anyone else have feedback? I mean, that was a long presentation and there was a lot in it and I totally understand, but um, this is our biggest job. So if people have thoughts, I don't want to completely scare you out of, out of sharing, you know, we had planned for about 20 minutes of discussion. So if there are things that you want to share or questions you want to ask, um, you know, feel free to ask them. Diane. Sorry, it just takes me a while to navigate around my screen. Um, Yeah, so thank you for the presentation. I think this year, more than any other year, I'm just feeling like I don't really know what's going on with the budget. And I think a lot of that is just COVID related stuff. And and just everybody's been very busy. We just haven't really gotten the information Kind of on a on a minute, not minute by minute, but you know, definitely more frequently than we've gotten it. So I, I'm I'm a bit lost um, in terms of like the we the the weeds, and I know this isn't a weeds type of um, presentation, but um, I'm looking at I'm looking at the percentage um, that we're that we're hitting taxpayers with. I'm trying to find it. Was it three point seven five? Is that right? Assessment. The assessment, yeah. 4.3. Sorry. 4.4 in Acton and and 5 point, almost 6 in Boxborough. Okay. Yep. So I I just, (laughs) you know, I hear hear what what you're saying about, you know, it's tight and, you know, there's a lot of unknowns, but I just feel like that's that's a big ask of the taxpayers. Um, I also have a concern about E and D. Um, I, I, this happens. This happens almost every year. Um, I, I don't remember what E and D is. I, I forgot to look it up. Where are we at E and D? Um, are we are we at, within our guidelines or are we below our guidelines? Um, but I know that you know Mass General Law uh, Chapter Sixteen um, says. Uh, 
that if we have more than 5%, um, then we need to apply it um, to reduce the amount of the assessment on the member cities and towns. And so we have not achieved, a, 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 as far as I know, we have not achieved a savings in our e and in excess of 5%. So to take the 965 out of e and um, I think would probably, we'd be in violation of our voted policy guidance. And for, you know, for six years now that I've been on the committee, Acton FinCom guidance has always been to avoid reliance on reserves except for one-time expenses. So I'm not sure, I just want to have a better understanding how level funding E&D is even a thing. Um, if When I look at, you know, what, what we've put E&D toward in, like, so I went over like some, some past year. So in FY19, it was seven, we took seven, 775 and we put it towards single tier busing. That was a one-time expense. And FY20, we had, we put 60,000 toward two buses. Um, it just because of the single tier busing, we needed two more buses. Um, we put it toward capital projects. We put 200 for, toward the operating budget, which we were doing for years. And then in FY21, we, we took one, 180 and reduced ADK tuition for at least the first year. Although the rest was going to, you know, subsequent years was going to get um, absorbed into the operating budget, um, you know, and so forth. And so this idea of like level funding, it, it just it confuses me because I I I don't think that's the intent here. I don't think it's in Acton's best interest, especially this year. I'm all for reducing the assessment, um, but not for relying on a replenishment that may not materialize to. Um, and so I'm concerned. So like what happens if we don't get the expected replenishment? And I know that has averaged about $1 million a year. And, and the, the auditors come and they tell us a million dollars a year to send an E&D is very, uh, it's, it's right on target and for a, a budget this big. Um, and so about what happens if we are forced to sustain a one-time expense, which depletes E&D, um, so I just feel like this is, it's just risky to rely on e &D, uh, to take even more e d out, especially for Acton, which is at its levy limit. And we might be looking at an operational override if some catastrophic thing happened. And Acton tax, taxpayers are getting hit hard this year, bearing the tax increase of the West Acton Fire Station and the new school building. Um, and they have the additional financial stress of job and business losses due to COVID. And some Acton residents are kind of panicking because they've had increased valuation of their, their homes. Um, our tax rate is always, already one of the highest in the Commonwealth. Um, and we have a very fiscally diverse community, I think more than our, our comparable communities because of this, you know, the condos all along 2A, which make this community more affordable um, to a more wide, uh, diverse you know, people of economic means. So, um, I don't know. I just feel like I just before we kind of level fund E&D for FY22 at $965,000, I'd like to see the team make make cuts. I don't know if there's room to make cuts. Um, it seems draconian to move to like a level service budget. Um, I don't think that's sustainable. I've asked that question and it's not sustainable, but I'd like to see us otherwise try to get under 3%. Uh, and and it's it's hard for me to imagine how like we can keep sustaining these three million dollar increases every year. So don't have good answers, but um, that's those are my concerns just at this stage of the game. And I appreciate you letting me go on for so long. Go ahead, Dave. Just just a real quick clarification of Diane um, characterizing E&D e &D usage in these preliminary numbers is down by 180,000. So in, in needing to develop a model, uh, the Acton Boxboro piece of the ALG model, they go out for a number of years. What I did is to try and rent and, and, and lower the annual usage of e and from last year. Last year was a million 145, not 965. So in that long-term model, I've tried to bring it down gradually. You can, it would be nice, but but unrealistic to think we could drop it from a million one 
to back to the good old days of two hundred thousand dollars in one year. But just just so you know, Diane, that that these numbers include a reduction in E&D usage. Can I make one comment too, Diane? Hearing kind of that number is actually incredibly helpful to us um, because that's the that's exactly the direction we're hoping to get. Of like, what what do you think we need to kind of be aiming for? Um, you know, in, in terms of what we think we can do, we have already have a list of some strategies we're thinking about. Um, I, you know, getting to 3% or slightly under will certainly be challenging, but I think we can probably get there without doing major damage to our classrooms. Um, if we really think about going below that, we're, we're only into personal at that point. Um, and, you know, I think, so that's something we've been thinking a lot about, but we needed to kind of test that theory with the committee tonight. Um, you know, because if you feel like even that number is not going to do it, then we're going to have to really take a hard look at some of our personnel decisions and things like that. Um, and that, that's where we're trying to think about, okay, what do our kids need versus how do we make this happen for our communities? Adam? Yeah, Diane, I, I appreciate the questions. I, I, with um, with regards to the conversation around E and D, it's uh, it's definitely a conversation that we have every meeting at, at Budget Sub, and and the numbers that we saw tonight were the preliminary numbers. It was assuming, like Dave said, carrying over last year minus the 170k. We we struggle with this. We we have the same conversations internally that you're asking us about one time use and is it sustainable and are we meeting our guidelines and and all of that. Um, so we we will continue to have those conversations in the budget subcommittee. And as we I, my my hope would be that as we come with the, the the next iterations of the budget, we'll have some more justification and thought around that. Um, and then the the other thing that I would say um, is that all of your questions are great, and I think. Um, to, to Peter's questions at the beginning and end of the presentation, the feedback that we want from the from the committee is where do we put our priorities? Um, one thing I noticed is our guidelines didn't necessarily um, when we when we created them didn't necessarily consider the ability of the towns to to handle a, a specific increase. Um, and so uh, that's something that Peter added to his questions. It's something that I think we need to balance with the fact that we've got a lot of learning loss that we need to recover um, from the past year and a half of pandemic based learning and and uh, we as a committee need to, to um, come up with our point of view on that and then be able to defend that as we go in front of town meetings to defend our budget. So it would be good to get feedback from all the committee members around those types of questions. Well, and I think I just want to add on to what Adam said that it was important to me and in the conversations that Peter and I had about presenting something so that everyone could understand where we would be if we just replicated what we did last year. And so decisions about putting the E&D numbers in as they are now were really so that there aren't so many variables changing so that people could understand the impact of increased teacher salaries or increased healthcare costs or, you know, whatever it is, um, so that we could all be on the same page about making whatever kinds of decisions or, or making priorities that, that we need to have. Because it's, it's important for everyone to have this sort of foundational understanding of what year-to-year -year spending looks like if you don't change anything. John, are you re-raising your hand or did you just not put it down? Yes, go ahead. Well, because there was so much discussion about E&D, I just want to remind everybody that when we presented to town meetings last year, we included in our budget request a $500,000 COVID contingency. And we said that one of two things would happen. Either one, we would get through the year and either because we got money from other places or because things didn't happen, uh, we would return that money to E&D or we would use it um, because we did have COVID related expenses that exhausted that $500,000. And I just wanna make sure that as we go through this process and talk about um, you know, the, the net return, that we're clear about what the fate of that $500,000 was because that's what we represented to the communities. And you know, just to, to John's point too, it, it made me think we're also hesitant at this point to make too many reductions um, because we don't know what the additional federal stimulus will look like. I, I My gut tells me we're gonna get some additional federal stimulus. We just don't know what that's gonna look like right now. Um, and you know, we know that once we set our budget, we can't then increase it, right? Um, but we can decrease it. 
So that's that's one of the challenges. So, you know, I think, you know, one thing to, to think about, like, even if the committee ends up in February voting a budget, you know, based on maybe some assumptions about some stimulus that we really don't have an idea of, the committee could always choose to lower that budget prior to town meetings, but you couldn't raise the budget prior to town meetings. So that just to, that's something, you know, we've talked about strategically going in too. Okay. So it seems like we don't have additional questions now, which is fine. That was a lot of information to take in. I think it's hard. So if you do have comments or clarifications or questions, sending them in an email to Peter and Dave is completely and totally appropriate. Yeah, me and Marie too. Please. And Marie. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. So thank you guys for such a thorough thing. I'm sure that everybody can look back at the packet and take a closer look at the numbers and understand where they need more information. Um, do we need to do ALG and BLF updates? And I want to do a quick apology to uh, Gary if he's here, because when we spoke at BLF the other day, I was unsure about how we were fully going to handle public participation within the meeting. Um, and just assure him that this is, you know, we, we will have more discussion. So Gary, reach out if you have actual questions, because it was decided that we can't pick and choose our participants. Um, do we need to give ALG or, or BLF updates? Yes? Okay, go ahead, John. Did you want to give it? Yes. Um, so at the last ALG meeting, um, the Acton Finance Committee uh, presented their point of view, and their point of view included their desire, which had been stated previously, that there be no uh, tax increase in Acton this year. So um, yeah, I, I think it's important to understand um, where the Finance Committee in Acton is as they're thinking about the pressures on our budget. Um, I think that in many ways, and in fact, in most ways, um, the things that we as a school committee vote on align Acton and Boxborough. But when it comes to what you know, Dave refers to as assessments, and I think of as revenues associated with the property taxes on Acton and Boxborough, um, we actually have two different positions. And I wanted to just briefly remind everyone of how different those positions actually are. Um, by way of a little bit of history, um, in fiscal 13, the Acton tax rate was $19.10. And the Boxborough tax rate was $17.69. So it was 93% of the Acton tax rate. If you roll forward to the tax bills that people received um, this last month, uh, in FY21, the tax rate in Acton is $20.23 uh, per thousand. So that's up about a dollar you know, from that FY13 number that I just quoted. While the Boxborough tax rate is $17.17. .17. So it's actually down 50 cents from that rate in FY13. Um, and that means that the Boxborough tax rate right now is 85% of the Acton tax rate. Um, so when you know BLF meets to discuss um, the ability to expend more money on the schools, they come to that from a position where they are not at the levy limit and where their tax you know, rate is, is modest compared to the Acton tax rate. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, when Acton comes to look at our ability um, to fund, you know, the kinds of assessments we're looking at, um, we are at the levy limit, um, and we have a tax rate, you know, which is right near the top. Um, and because it's late, I don't want to go into this too much, but, you know, for people who have looked at migration around the country, um, everybody knows that it's great to be in places like Massachusetts and Minnesota and some other places because they've got great services. But with those services come high taxes. Um, and, what you can see in terms of a general migration is that if those tax rates become too high, um, you know, our communities become not sustainable. They become hollowed out. So there's a real danger associated with letting those tax rates go too high. So that's the discussion that we have to have on the Acton side. So um, much as we might like to do, you know, things, you know, a lot of things related to trying to repair some of the damage associated with this past year, 
the ability to put additional dollars on the table is really low. Um, and I think that's the sense of the, the finance committee's point of view. Um, and that's, you know, I think the mindset that the Acton side needs to bring into this discussion. It's late, so I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> I'll hold my fire for, for, for budget subcommittee. <laughs> um, okay. Did anyone? I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll give a quick update on BLF because I think it's important to note that we did um, we did uh, reaffirm at the BLF that the town meeting is, is still on schedule as it was showed in the presentation before. So there's, um, there's uh, no plans right now to delay Boxborough town meeting. Um, and, and additionally, we shared the preliminary um, assessment number and uh, understandably the, the BLF was quite concerned with a close to 6% increase in their assessment as well. So I think we, we all have a lot of work to do to get to something that's palatable for both towns. See, Adam is so eloquent and doesn't say inflammatory things like I would have. Thanks, Adam. Um, okay, so our ongoing business, we have a consent agenda. Items on the consent agenda do not usually require discussion and are approved with one vote unless any member would like to hold an item for discussion and a separate vote. I'll read each item name, and if any member would like it held, please say hold. Otherwise, we'll, we'll have a motion to approve at the end. Uh, the first thing is the approval of the meeting minutes from January 7th of 2021. The second is an approval of an anonymous donation of $627 to the Student Assistance Homeless and Food Assistance Fund. And the third is an approval of a donation of 3,000 No Place for Hate masks for students and staff from the AB United Way. Move to approve. With Greg. Second. Wow, that was like a three-way motion. <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, if unless there's any discussion, we'll do a roll call vote. John? Yes. Adam? Yes. Diane? Yes. Angie? Yes. Kira? Yes, with gratitude. Yevin? No. Yes. Nora? Yes. Amy? Yes, with gratitude. Me? Yes, with gratitude. And I'll just note that Jenny needed to step out. So, Beth, you can note that. That's why she didn't vote. Um, okay, so now we have a structured learning time update from Peter. So there is no presentation for this. This is just an opportunity to you know let you know. I obviously our timeline to implement the structured learning time did not provide for a school committee meeting in between the time that um, we last presented to you and you voted to apply for the waiver and you know the time date when we actually needed to implement these changes. Um, you know, as is noted in the, the packet, in the memo, the learning time waiver was not approved by Desi and the commissioner. Um, and so we did have to implement changes, but we needed to begin being implemented uh, this past Monday. So we worked um, with our leadership team along with ABEA and our staff to identify options that were realistic and could be implemented, um, you know, on, on pretty Pretty quick turnaround. Our teaching staff, I'm very, very grateful to all they're doing and they continue to do. Um, I know this year is tremendously challenging for them. Um, this was a quick reaction. We're implementing this week. Uh, we're putting a gradual implementation timeline in place because we know this is also a change of routine, not only for our educators, but also families at home um, and trying to get kids online and our kids. So it's taking place over the course of this week. Uh, we have worked through some technical challenges um, with the increased bandwidth that we've needed on our network to be able to support this. Um, but we'll be working through that over the next few days. I'm happy to answer any questions, but um, you know, you saw a brief note in the packet along with a copy of what we provided to our families. Adam. Uh, uh, yeah, I have a quick comment, which is, um, I found it very frustrating that the response we got from Desi provided no additional detail other than the fact that this was denied. Um, I, I understand the motivation and the reasoning that they're putting this in place, um, but I think it's it's a really, they put us in a very difficult position um, to first uh, give us the opportunity to apply for a waiver, but then to just deny it without much information. You know, there are many people in the community who are equally as frustrated by that. So just wanted to express my frustration. Well, I wanted to acknowledge the fact that, you know, with respect to what Desi's, you know, reasoning was, I, I do think that the letter that we ended up writing in support of our waiver spoke 
in depth about um, how we put social emotional learning at, at the forefront of, of our priorities and that it was for those reasons that we were applying for the waiver. So um, is there anything else? Anyone else have a question or a comment about that, Ginny? Yeah, I, I want to echo Adam's uh, frustration and, and state that I, I think that our state government has been um, not only, you know, not proactive in a number of ways, but actually throwing up roadblocks and, and unfunded mandates and all sorts of piling on um, to, you, to local districts uh, at, at, in a time of crisis. And I just... And, you know, I'm, I'm really, um, I was extremely disappointed by that response and um, think that people at the state level just don't understand what local districts are going through and especially what our educators are going through, which, um, you know, I think in a lot of ways is just completely unsustainable for them. So I, I just want to share Adam's um, frustration and bewilderment at what is happening at the, at the state level. I'll also know that there are school committees who are writing things and agreeing to them and sending them off. If that's something that people are interested in, and we're not going to create it at, at a business meeting, but if people want to work on that, it's certainly something to be considered. Um, I think from the listserv, there was maybe some examples of something that, that different other districts have been putting together and sending forth. All right, on to the next item. Uh, the recommendation to approve non-resident tuition rate for the RJ Gray Junior High School STEP program. Peter, do you want to speak to that? Yep, and I'm just promoting um, Debbie Dixon, who has been with us in the audience to be a panelist, um, in case you have a couple questions. Um, but, you know, just essentially, there's a quick note in the packet. Um, but we have an opportunity to expand um, some tuition opportunities um, at our junior high school STEP program. Um, our STEP program is a continuum that also serves students at our high school. Um, so we wanted to bring that forward because any, um, you know, out of district tuitions for special education programs do have to be approved by the school committee. Debbie, do you want to just talk briefly to, to a little bit of why we chose that tuition rate and the thinking around this? Sure. Um, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, among my colleagues um, in the area, uh, we've had lots of discussions about the programs that we offer in our local schools, and there's often um, inquiries about whether or not we would tuition students to one another's schools. Um, for years, Acton Boxborough has um, allowed tuitions, uh, tuition students into the ODP and PACE program at the high school. Um, and then it, it occurred to us that we have the feeder program, the STEP program at the junior high. And um, there have been some inquiries as to whether or not we would allow students to start at the junior high level. So um, in the event that we have students that could be tuitioned in, I think that it would be um, it would behoove us to have that um, in place and ready to go. Um, as an offering to our neighboring communities. Um, the tuition would be set the, as the same as the high school because it's um, pretty comparable in terms of the services. It's different because of the um, level of uh, level of the students. Um, at the high school, there's more focus on occupation vocational. At the junior high, it's more, um, it's pre-voc and uh, academic. Uh, but the students still receive occupational therapy, speech, um, speech and language, and other support services. So I do see it as comparable. Um, so the tuition would re would be the same throughout the continuum. I think it was around one hundred for this current school year one hundred and eighty one dollars a day, and at some change. Does anyone have a question? Adam? Uh, I just have a comment, which is I, I, I wholeheartedly support this. Anytime that we can have a student, um, uh, whether they're in our district or from another district, take place in a program that exists um, included in the, uh, our standard education program, I think is um, just a great opportunity. So um, I think it's great that we, we broaden that opportunity to students from other communities. Uh, 
Great. Okay. So there is, if there's no other questions, there is, um, there is a recommended motion in the packet. I'll move to approve the non-resident tuition rate for the RJ Gray Junior High School Secondary Transition Education Program step as presented. Second. Any further discussion? All right, Adam? Yes. Angie? Yes. Okay, Diane? Yes. John? Yes. Kira? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Nora? Yes. Jenny? Yes. Amy? Yes. And myself? Yes. Thank you, everybody. Um, Debbie, okay. thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Oh, good. All right. The FY22 school calendar. This is our second read. Um, and as those of you who have been on the committee know that this is a really late vote on a school calendar. I know that there's been real interest in the community as to what day we're going to agree to start on. So um, the the uh, idea is to vote tonight. So Marie, are you doing this piece? Yep. Um, hi, everybody. So there are two possible calendars in your packet they've not changed since last time we did received almost no feedback from any committee members um the uh, the way the beginning of the year falls Rosh Hashanah is actually the day after Labor Day um so the 6th and 7th are no school days of September um and our teachers contract has no school on the Friday before Labor Day so that will be a long weekend no matter what we do um, so you really have a choice between starting school on Monday, September 30th, which has it ending on June 15th plus snow days, or starting school on September 8th, which has school ending on June 21st plus snow days. Um, and I, we're not making a recommendation. It's really up to the committee. Um, the one thing I wanted to add is we've been working with the ABEA. As you know, this year we've had our early release days on Wednesdays. Traditionally, they had been on Thursdays for elementary. Um, and we have found that to be very successful. And so we're recommending that early release days stay on Wednesdays going forward. Um, and that's not written in the calendar here. We would add it upon your vote. Um, but the ABEA has agreed to that. It allows us to have our pre-K program aligned with the elementary program on their early release days and through their professional learning opportunities will now be pre-K to six available, including the pre-K. And in anticipation of them moving into the new school with two elementary schools, it, it will be great in many ways. Um, so we ask for you to choose either option one or option two. There's a proposed vote in the um, packet, in the um, cover sheet, uh, but we really don't know which you prefer. So. so the way that I like to have these discussions is for us to have a discussion first, even though I know that that's not what John likes to do. So I would prefer that we discuss it first and then someone puts forward a motion um, especially because there hasn't been any feedback thus far. I think it's less confusing that way. Nora, did you have a question or a comment? Oh, sorry. I was just ready to start the calendar discussion, but maybe not ready yet. No, we can start the calendar discussion. I just don't want to start it with a motion. Oh, okay. That's all. So if you want to start the calendar discussion, be my guest. Okay. Um, <laughs> I usually like an earlier date, but given... COVID and the uncertainty about what fall is going to look like still, um, I would push for a later start date just to give us more, more time. Amy, I saw your hand next. I would say that with the uncertainty of COVID, the later start date would make more sense. Um, it's more of an opportunity for things to settle down so that we can actually start fully in person. Um, but that said, I have three boys graduating that year, so you, you know, might want to disregard what I have to say, because <laughs> they're going to get out early anyway. <laughs> Jenny? 
Um, you know, I think that the, the June 21st end date plus snow days is, is just really an issue. Um, I don't think, uh, uh, you know, from talking to teachers and other families and, and knowing children, you know, nothing good is happening in late June. People are disengaged. Uh, he, students are signed up for things and are, are taking off. I think, um, I don't think it makes any sense to have that late of a, of an end date personally. Kira. Oh, I don't even know. I don't even know. Um, I had a question about preschool and, and, and what you just said about the Wednesdays and it being realigned and, um, I, I, are there specific hours for preschool? Do we reduce the hours of preschoolers by, by having that half day aligned on the Wednesday? Could somebody explain that really quick? We do not reduce the hours of preschool by having that aligned. Um, most of our preschool classes go four days a week. Um, and we have two classes that go five days a week. And um, they have an early release one day a week. They, Friday used to be the day that preschoolers didn't attend for most of the classes, and we've moved it to Wednesday this year. Um, for lots of reasons, Thursday wouldn't really work. Um, so we reduced their hours only of those two additional, two of the classes um, this year, and we would like to continue that so that the teachers can participate in professional learning. Does that answer your question, Kira? You're muted. I know, I'm sorry, it's late. So I'm, I, I just wanna make sure that I'm really clear. You just said that we reduce their hours for this year. So you wanna sustain that reduction into next year? Yes. Okay. Okay, and as for the rest of it, um, I, I was inclined to toward um, option two. I am, I, I, but I, I hear Jenny on, on the lateness. I, I feel like we do this every year and then there's much discussion about whether or not June is, um, you know, is a nice time of year anyway, because, you know, sometimes it's rainy and it's cold and whatever, and it's still hot and lovely in August. And, you know, don't you just want to go to the beach for one more weekend? I feel like, um, there's no good answer here. So I, um, I, I, I'm inclined for number two, but I will yield to the wisdom of the group. Adam? Yeah, it's interesting. I don't, I don't know if we have consensus because I, I, I'm definitely more in favor of option one. Um, so I'll, I'll respond to, um, first, I agree with Ginny. I think it's risky to have our last day with snow days um, so late in the year. Um, I understand that the beginning of the year in option one is is broken up a lot, but I, I'm, I don't really find an issue with that or challenged with either a broken up beginning of the year or a, a late end to the year. And then with regards to the comments about getting extra time to know what's going on with, with COVID and, and all of that, you know, we, we pushed our start date back this year because of that. And I think we should commit to something that we want without um, necessarily considering what may or may not happen with that. If we find out that we're in line to get vaccinations for teachers and it doesn't happen until the 31st, then we'll make a change to schedule at that point when, when we know more information. But at this point, I think we should start earlier and, and end earlier for no other reason than I think it's risky to put us so close to the end of the school year and the school contract for the teachers. Angie? Yes, um, I agree with Adam. And was because we really don't know what the pandemic is going to go through this year. So with the risk of ending late, and I prefer option one at this point because we just don't cannot, based on some prediction, estimate that um, it's going to be better later. Yeah. Diane? Yeah, I agree. I'm going with option one for all those reasons. I, I just think it's a bad idea to have a, a, a late end date. Uh, John? So I believe, you know, we had this discussion before about question of uh, could we uh, have remote days on snow days? You know, should we get pushed and that there's no answer about that right now? Um, I believe that, you know, if there was actually an issue associated with snow days, if, if there's a good chance we would find a way to do that. And I think, um, you know, I'm in favor of the, the delayed start. Um, 
I'll just say that the last time that we, not this year, because obviously Jesse made all kinds of changes and requirements in terms of days, days we needed to be in and not, but the last time we had a really late start, we were pushed up against summer camps and there was all kinds of kids who had started summer camps because Massachusetts is already really late for starting school um, in, in terms of a national um, everything. And I understand that we don't know about summer camps and that may change. There may be all kinds of people that don't want to send their kids to summer camps, but I do recall that that was actually a really big issue um, with programs that were starting um, at the end of June when we got there. So um, Jenny, did you have something else you wanted to say? Or did you want to I, I do. I just wanted to clarify, Marie, your comments. So are you saying that there was a cut to the number of preschool hours this year due to COVID and that that is going to be a sustained cut going forward? Let me try that again. So um, there are, I think, nine preschool classes total, and um, seven of them run five, four days a week. So those seven out of the nine were not impacted at all. We have two classes that ran the fifth day, um, and we've made those two classes four and a half days instead of five days so that um, they are consistent with the rest of the district and the staff in those classes can participate in the professional learning. It's been actually a contractual issue to have only a couple of teachers not getting the early release days, not participating in professional learning. Um, so we had always intended to do that when we moved into the new building, um, but we did it this year to get everybody on the same schedule with COVID and for lots of reasons, nursing coverage, et cetera. So why are those, why are those two classes meeting five days a week instead of four days a week? Like IEP. the reps of the seven. A different level of need of the students. IEPs. Okay, so that means that the, the, the two classes who are experiencing a, a cut in hours are, are special education, preschool special education students? Yes, the whole preschool is special. Is a no, special I get that, but, but... Yes, yes. Okay, so, I, I mean, I, I would... I would, you know, have a uh, have an issue with that. I think that those students need probably more time, not less. Um, I'm not in favor of that. Marie and Mitty, this is Dawn. Um, I believe that the ABA programs, even before um, this year, were operating on a half day on Fridays. I believe the students were dismissed at 12 or 12:30, so it's actually not a reduction in hours. I would want to double check that though. Please, I'd appreciate that. All right, Ginny, we'll look at this offline. Um, okay. I'm actually not positive. Um, okay, I'd appreciate a follow up on that. So, it's a complicated issue, but not necessarily a calendar issue. Like, we can, still have can to I make it. Yeah, I'd like to make a suggestion maybe table that part of the motion yeah. um, and instead just pick, pick which option for a start date. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Evan, did you have something to share or comment? Uh, thank you, Tessa. So, uh, yeah, so I've, I'm uh, I lean towards uh, option one. I would uh, start early. So uh, I would say it's uh, to, for the benefit of uh, in-person learning, right? So we wanted to have a student uh, uh, so take care of their benefits. So it will be safer to have a uh, in-person learning uh, in the summer, actually. So we, we don't really know what's going to happen in the next winter. So, uh, so uh, to, to, go, to go extreme, I would favor actually students to take the full summer to learn, right? And have a very long winter. I mean, just a joking. That's just to say, I prefer uh, option one. Okay. Does someone want to make a motion? Adam? Go ahead, Adam. Um, I move to approve the proposed calendar number one with the start date for students of August 30th, 2021 and staff professional days scheduled for August 25th and 26th. The last day of our of school would be June 15th, 2022, plus snow days. Second. Don't forget that last part. Elementary early release days are scheduled on Wednesdays. Didn't we just say we weren't going to put that part in? I thought that you were just discussing that as 
just discussing the preschool part. I don't think we're are were we or no? Sorry. Well, Maybe we can still schedule the early release days on Wednesdays, but we have to figure out the preschool hours and come back to you on that. But that's but not it, part of it. The game. Whether we do it on Thursday or Wednesday doesn't change the preschool approach. All right, so I, I'll, I'll add to my motion that elementary early release days are scheduled on Wednesdays. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Second, but the understanding that we're not changing anything about preschool tonight. But that's not even in the motion. So you don't have to worry about that. Okay. So I think we've all discussed our things. So it's okay if you don't want to vote for it. That's, that's the whole point of having two different motions. But... Um, Ginny? Yes. Angie? Yes. John? No. Adam? Yes. Uh, Kira? Yes. Nora? No. Diane? Yes. Amy? No. Yevon? Yes. And me? Yes. Beth, I wasn't adding up votes. I think it was six weighted votes to no. Two acting in one box burn. Okay. So it still passes, right? Because it's just a majority. Okay. John and I are agreeing, so it must pass. Okay, great. Thank you, John. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> All right, so school will start on August 30th. We'll right. get that out to parents and staff yep. as soon as we can. Thank you, everybody. All right. Next on the agenda is the SOA plan, second read, and a vote. Peter? All right. So, you know, there's a brief note in your packet, but we presented this at the last meeting. There was a significant amount of school committee feedback. Um, our team did take that back um, and revise the plan. It did take us a little time to do it because it was at the same time we were trying to work through um, the time on learning changes uh, with DESE and the budget presentation and several other COVID related things. Um, so it took a little extra time. We were able to make some revisions um, that we believe reflect most of the feedback we received. We also then sent it to our CPAC leadership, um, you know, preliminarily, um, you know, we let them know that they're welcome to bring it to the full membership at some point um, and get more feedback from members and we're happy to bring it back and revise the plan with the state later. Um, but they, I believe at this point, you know, felt relatively comfortable with what was being submitted. Um, we also sent it out to our DEI advisory group. We haven't had a chance to meet with them yet. Um, so we would like to approach it the same way, but we did not receive, I don't think any feedback directly um, at this point. So. Um, we'd like to present this for your approval, um, you know, to submit to the state. We are a few days late at this point on it. Um, and if we receive significant feedback later in the game, we can always come back, revise it, resubmit. And there was a decision on, on mine and Peter's part that uh, I, I gave the thumbs up that it was okay for us to send it in late because I thought the feedback received last time was important enough that we take the time to revise it. And so he did. Um, Angie, did you have a question? Yes. Um, so, one clarification. I understand the uh, how the subgroup is select are selected. So that's based on the assessment among the uh, so, uh, subgroups that need help, right? Not uh, not everybody, right? Yeah. The the just to go way up on the balcony and take a bird's eye view of this. The Student Opportunity Act was specifically designed to help districts focus attention on certain subgroups and populations within their schools that have been underserved by those districts. Um, it's not intended to just have something that tries to benefit everyone equally at this point. Um, you know, we know and believe our reading program will benefit everyone, but our specific focus of this plan is to um, put attention on groups that we have not historically served to the best of our ability. So as required by the state, the state requires us to pick out those. Okay. Subjects. Correct. Yeah. If we said this benefits everyone, the state would send it back to us and say, that's not the plan. The question I have is, is for low subgroup, for the people who in that subgroup that needs help, right? Only not the whole group, right? 
Okay, thank you. Okay, does anyone else have a question? Diane? I'm wondering if um, this required any additional uh, resource allocation. I, I didn't think it did, but I didn't have time to compare the two. Um, there are no resources in this. There are resources that we've allocated to, you know, special education support, you know, directly. Um, you know, for example, um, we, all of our special educators, we have a plan that every single one will go through the full Wilson train. Um, you know, because we, we know that that's an area that we want to focus on to make sure we're implementing Wilson with fidelity in every setting. Um, and we want every special educator to just to have that capability. We're doing that. That's not part of this plan because the plan is really at this point focused on those subgroups and with, with the intention of moving that along. I make a motion then to approve the um, SOA. Okay. Second. Great. If there is no further discussion, then we will vote. Uh, Angie? Yes. John? Yes. Adam? Yes. Kira? Uh, yes. Yevon? Yes. Nora? Yes. Diane? Yes. Amy? Yes. Ginny? Yeah. And myself, thanks. Okay. So the next thing on the agenda, and we're almost done, <laughs> are the um, revised operating protocols. If you remember at our last meeting, Adam suggested that we add in um, some ex explicit wording um, showing our commitment to anti-racism and equity. Um, so the revised, for the third time, protocols are in uh, your packet with the changes tracked so that you can see what was done and We'd look, like to approve them tonight so that we can get them signed. Adam? Uh, I'll make a motion to approve with gratitude to both Nora and the committee as a whole. Nora came up with the great idea of having our additions being um, taken directly from the statement um, that we uh, put out as a committee uh, a couple weeks ago. Does someone want to second that? Second. Second. Um, is there any additional discussion or questions that people have? See, you know that it's late when no one has anything to say. <laughs> All right. I, I think it looks great. Uh, there's no reason to have any additional discussion. I think they did a wonderful job. So thank you um, to all of those that, that, that worked on this. Um, we can vote. Angie? Yes. John? Yes. Uh, Adam? Yes. Kira? <laughs> You're always yes. Oh my God, Yevin. Yes. <laughs> Nora. Yes. Diane. Yes. Amy. Yes. Jenny. Yes. And no, Jenny, I didn't vote thanks on the last one. I said yes, and then thanks, and so I'll say yes, and then thank you to everyone who worked, who took time outside of our meeting time to work on that and to bring something um, to us, and so. Um, Beth will get us this to sign in some capacity. I don't know how. May have to stop it and sign it. Um, okay, subcommittee and member member report. So, um, Diane, is there a policy update? Um, just that we met on the 15th, we're, um, we're, uh, our intention is to bring forward, uh, finally, hopefully, the workforce diversity policy um, at our next meeting, perhaps, or at least in February. Okay. Um, were there any other things that people wanted to report on or need to report on at this meeting? I have nothing else on my agenda, so I wasn't sure. Uh, the joint PTO met. I don't know that there's anything that we need to report. Um, okay. Peter, is there any, we have need for an executive session tonight, but is there anything that you wanted to note in the FYI before we adjourn to our executive warrant. session? Oh, sorry, the warrant. Sorry, I skipped right over it. Who wants to do that? <laughs> I will. Hold on. Okay. We have warrants to approve tonight. 
I move that the school committee vote to approve payroll warrant as follows. Number P2115 dated 1-14-2021 in the amount of $2,754,830.97. Payroll deduction warrant as follows. Number 21-015PR dated 1-14-2021 in the amount of $556,154.17. And vendor warrant as follows, number 21-014, dated 1-7-2021, in the amount of $573,951.88. Second. Second. <laughs> Angie? Yes. John? Yes. Adam? Yes. Kira? Yes. Yevin? Yes. Nora? Yes. Diane? Yes. Amy? Yes. Jenny? Yes. Me? Yes. All right. Now I'll ask Peter if there's anything in the FYI that he wanted to draw attention to before we adjourn for our executive session. Um, just again, thank you to the anonymous donors for that student assistance fund. And you know, community members are welcome to donate that to that. And they can contact David Bertolino. Um, also, we have upcoming QPR trainings. Um, and there's a link to register for those if anyone is interested. Um, and then I also just want to call your attention um, specifically to the EDCO Collaborative FY20 annual report. But most importantly, you really should read the audit report. That That is key. Um, specifically, there is a statement in the audit report for a second year in a row of substantial doubt um, of whether or not that organization can continue as a collaborative. And it's that that is significant. So we're going to be talking about that more um, probably at the next meeting. Um, you know, and, and I think we're, we're probably getting to a point at EDCO where we have to discuss our next steps with that. So just please be aware of that. Um, and that audit report is, is important. You don't, you don't have to read the whole thing. And if you have a question on what you should read of it, please email Dave and he can point out some highlights from it. I'll point out that the packet stops, um, with the contents, but not the full report from EDCO. Just scroll down page 101. We don't, we don't actually get the rest of the information in the packet. Well, I guess we really summarized that. Um, we will we will get that out to you via email and include it in an updated posting too. So sorry about that. That's right. I'll also note that uh, the the deadline to pull papers in Acton for the upcoming election is is fast approaching, um, and there are two school committee seats um, that are up for election this year um, for three year terms. So I believe and- February. Yeah. Nope. Last day to file. Yes. Last day to obtain papers is February 5th. Last day to file them is February 9th. Did Dawn have a question? I see a hand up. I don't know. Her hand I think was that up. might have been from earlier. It was up before when she asked a question. Okay. I think we're oh. okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Given the need for an executive session, I will entertain a motion for an executive session to be convened under MGL Chapter 30A. Section 21A, Purpose 3, to discuss strategy with respect to litigation because an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the committee. This is in regard to the financial position of the educational collaborative and possible future litigation. The committee will not return to open session. So moved. Second. All right. Angie? Yes. John? Yes. Adam? Yes. Kira? Yes. Yevon? Yes. Nora? Yes. Diane? Yes. Amy? Yes. Uh, Jenny? Yes. Sorry, I forgot your name for a sec. That's how tired I am. (laughs) Emmy, yes. All right. So Peter sent a separate executive session link that 